Commissioner uh, Montesino. See him, but I do see Commissioner Hurst. I'm here. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Peterson. Here. Commissioner Northcutt. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. Here. Okay, and uh, I don't see Commissioner Friend or this alternate yet. But you do have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we will now move on to oral communications. Uh, oral communications is a time for members of the public to address the commission on items within the jurisdiction of the commission that are not already on the agenda. Uh, the commission will listen to all communications uh, and in compliance with state law, will not take action on items that are not on the agenda today. So I will go ahead and begin calling on. Chair Brown, yes. I, I, could you clarify for the public? Yes. When, it, when is it appropriate for them to speak on the question of whether they uh, you want the rail to stay or not to stay? Should it be before we go into closed session yes. or here during oral communication, but not both times? Let them know what you think yes. they should do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. I was uh, thinking about that and <laughs> I forgot. So yes. thanks for catching that. Uh, yes. So we do have an item on our closed session agenda related to the rail line, which uh, we have received significant communication about. And there will be an opportunity to speak to the commission before that, before we go into closed session. So again, oral communications uh, will be for items that are not on either our open or closed session agenda. And with that, I will open up to oral communications and we will do uh, two minutes for, uh, for those statements. Okay, uh, let's see. I First up, I see Jack Brown. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for serving on the RTC. My name is Jack Brown, and I'm a 10-year resident of Santa Cruz County. On December 14th, the Yes Greenway Committee delivered 16,213 signatures to the Greenway Initiative to the county clerk. The signatures were collected by 170 volunteers who attended farmers markets across the county, went door to door in every supervisory district, did innumerable tabling events at grocery and retail stores and public venues, attended running and bike races, walks, public art shows, and other community events. We are confident that we have far exceeded the minimum requirement of 11,919 signatures to put the Greenway Initiative on the June ballot. The signature total of 16,213 is the most signatures collected on any issue in the history of Santa Cruz County, which demonstrates the public's desire to provide its input on the question of the Greenway Initiative, but also that it wants this issue settled once and for all. Thank you for your service to the community. I know that you also want to listen to a broader group than the same people who come to this meeting each month. I learned collecting signatures that the broader community strongly supports Greenway and wants it done now in the next few years. Greenway collected over 10,000 signatures in 2018 and now over 16,000 with very little overlap. So you can be assured that over 23,000 voters already know. <laughs> Those who oppose the Greenway tried unsuccessfully to stop people from voting. By contrast, the community has spoken loud and clear to express its constitutional right to vote. We look forward to the vote in June and a decisive resolution on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, so next up is Judy Gittleson. Hi, good morning, commissioners. I'm Judy Gittleson. I'm a Watsonville resident, and I hope the Regional Transportation Commission continues to improve the tracks as indicated in Measure D. And I loved the TIG M demonstration train. Would love to see it return and appreciate all your work to make us a climate 
sensitive to the climate crisis and move us toward uh, um, zero emission transportation. Thank you. And is there a way you can post what the closed session item is that regards the, that is in relation to the train? Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Kettleson. Uh, yes, so the, the closed session item is posted as an agenda item on at the end of our agenda. And we, um, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll have a report out today, um, just to clarify that for our, our last speaker. Um, Mr. Mattis, will there be a report out following today's uh, closed we, session? Yeah, we may have a report out with regards to direction but there would not, uh, staff is not recommending at the moment uh, any action that would cause the commencement of litigation at this point. Thank you. Uh, so stay tuned um, for uh, report, uh, appropriate reporting out from, from our closed session. Uh, okay, next up we have Mr. Scott, Barry Scott. Well, good morning. Uh Commissioner Brown and commissioners, I'm, I'm calling just to uh, thank everyone that's involved in taking care of that, that uh, fencing problem on the rail bridge going over the highway. I, I know my AFCOS community is super excited about that. And, and more broadly, I, I'm, I'm excited by Measure D and I reflect upon how diverse the investments uh, for that 2016 measure were and, and remain. Um, you know, I looked, I think there were 17 counties that year that had transportation sales tax measures. And I looked at most of them and most of them were like 85% for roads and highways that might have, they might have two or 5% for, uh, you know, bike paths or pedestrian improvements, but by and large, fully car related. And our, um, our measure D was so nicely balanced with 25% going to rail and trail and uh, and a good share going to public transit for Metro. And so I remain encouraged by the fact that our Measure D funding permits uh, provides 17% for the Coastal Rail Trail, which is a rail and trail project and 8% for rail maintenance and uh, further study. So I'm just encouraged whenever I, I read uh, what uh, our, our budget projections are, that so much money is being uh, dedicated to both of those uh, projects, which together are going to make such a huge difference for our transportation future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And Mr. Colligan, uh, Bud Colligan, you are up next. Welcome. And you are- Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brown, and good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Bud Colligan, and I'm a 25-year resident of Santa Cruz County. I want to take this time this morning to talk about the available public money and our ability as a community to fund our important priorities. So much of the rail trail debate has un unfolded with little discussion of money. Any train needs a one-half cent sales tax to provide local funds for operations and matching for any federal or state grants. Watsonville is at its maximum sales tax rate of 9.75% without a state exemption to increase it more. The City Council of Santa Cruz recently tried to increase its sales tax unsuccessfully. And there are rumors that the county wishes to increase its sales tax to close gaps in the general fund budget, also to the statutory limit. Let's be honest, this county and the cities within it don't have any spare change lying around and the voters are in no mood to tax themselves more. All the while, we have unfunded needs for repairing our roads, buying the bankrupt Watsonville Hospital, covering unfunded pension liabilities, creating shelter for the unhoused, building more affordable housing, ensuring all kids have reliable internet access at home during a, the ongoing pandemic, and covering unforeseen healthcare costs, creating more good jobs, and doing the things in transportation that are feasible, feasible and actionable with Measure D funds. Thank you for being prudent and wise with taxpayer resources and moving us forward in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Colligan. 
Buzz Anderson, it is your turn to speak. Well, hi, my name is Buzz Anderson. I'm a fourth generation uh, Santa Cruz native. Uh, there continue to be letters to the editor and social media posts and rhetoric about the trail and train as if nothing happened in 2021. So let's kind of take a review. In January, the Watsonville City Council unanimous, unanimously rejected a propane distribution facility on the rail line advocated by board members of court. Uh, in April, the RTC votes that the train business plan is financially infeasible. In June, the RTC votes to improve the, approve the evaluation of the interim trail in the segment 12 EIR and also to include an interim trail analysis for the Capitola trestle. In July, the County Council provides an impartial summary of the Greenway initiative. In September, the RTC issues rail banking questions and answers and facts that states that rail banking is possible on the rail corridor and should be pursued regardless of the planned use of the corridor. In November, the RTC staff rejects unsolicited rail proposal from Tig M and Roy Camp. And in December, Greenway submits 16,213 signatures to the county clerk to place the Greenway initiative on the ballot, the most ever collected in the history of Santa Cruz County. These are facts. There is a stubborn resistance from some people to recognize reality. At some point when decisions are made, this body needs to move on. What we are debating now is what kind of trail we want, an ultra expensive compromise trail with detours onto unsafe streets that does lasting environmental damage and provides almost no trail to serve Watsonville or Greenway to be built with no new taxes using the existing rail bed and infrastructure, serving over 2 million people per year from all districts and preserving the environmental integrity of the corridor. The voters will now decide if this commission can help. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> we will, uh, seeing no other uh, hands up, we will now move on to our next item. Are there any additions or deletions to today's agenda? Um, there is just a replacement page for item 13 and a handout for item 18, both of which are posted to our website. Thank you, Director Preston. Uh, okay, so we will now move on to our consent agenda. All items appearing on the consent agenda today are considered to be minor or non-controversial and will be acted upon in one motion. If no member of the RTC or the public wishes to pull that item for discussion and place it on the regular agenda. Members of the commission uh, may raise questions, uh, seek clarification or add directions to consent items without removing the item from the consent agenda, as long as there are no objections. Um, so <clears throat> I will ask commissioners if you have uh, items that you'd like to pull, or if you have questions or, or statements you'd like to make about items on our consent agenda today. Okay, um, hearing none, uh, I will take it. I have one item that I'd like to make a comment on when the time comes, um, but I'll take it out to the public for uh, comment. And we will start with um, Brian Trail Now. You have two minutes. Hi, this is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Thank you for taking my comment on. And I want to comment on item number nine, the pilot project for utilizing GOAT for controlling um, vegetation on the Santa Cruz Coastal Corridor. Um, you know, actually, I uh, 15 years ago had a property in the Santa Cruz Mountains that I used GOATs for, and there was mixed results. Um, the GOATs actually don't eat everything. <laughs> Um, and the, the goat supplier had to bring in additional food. Um, so at the end of the day, um, my comment is that you're going to need to do a mechanical um, controls. And really, um, at, at the ideal state is that we actually start using the Santa Cruz Coastal Del Corridor for transportation, active transportation, and begin using this piece of property. Um, it's been sitting there for 10 years, we all know, as, as we've owned it, and uh, 
the fact that we have to have a goat herd go and control the this valuable piece of property is somewhat embarrassing in the sense of letting this property sit there for 10 years and not using it. If we were using it, uh, we wouldn't need goats to come in and uh, control the excess growth. Um, in some sections, it really is overgrown. So, so if we really focus, um, you know, I won't go on and on about it, but in general, um, you're going to have to do mechanical cutting. Over. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Uh, David VB. Mr. Van Brink, you're up. Oh, good morning. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Um, yes, I, I also wanted to, to speak uh, briefly on item number nine. I, I, I won't presume to claim any higher technical knowledge of, of this topic, but I did want to request that um, that you please post pictures of the cute goats when the time comes. Uh, and that's all. Thank you. Mr. Van Brink. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, next up we have uh, Todd Marco. Hi, thank you. I, I may have missed my opportunity to make a, a general comment. So if that's the case, you can, uh, you know, just reset this. But um, yeah. otherwise, just Mr. real. Mr. Marco, we, we did just complete oral communications, which was general okay. comment for items that are not on our agenda today. Uh, so we are asking now for public comment about items on our consent agenda. Understood. Not, yeah. Sorry, I raised my hand too late. That's okay. Thank you. Please do send us a, an email with your, your message and we'll uh, have an opportunity at our next meeting for oral communications. Thank you. Um, okay, <clears throat> I see no other hands up from the public, so I'll bring it back. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Uh, okay, I hear uh, <laughs> a motion <laughs> by Commissioner Rotkin and a second. I think I heard Commissioner Schifrin's voice. Yes. Um, okay. Um, sorry, Mr. Commissioner Caput. We'll get you next time. <laughs> I think you you also tried to second that. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment before we take a vote about uh, the item item nine uh, regarding the use of goats a lot for vegetation management along the rail line. I just want to say a, a big thank you to our staff for exploring this. This item is coming to us following a discussion last year about the use of uh, chemicals for weed abatement on the rail line and uh, concerns from members of the community uh, as well as commissioners. And I just really wanna appreciate the responsiveness and the effectiveness of the, the staff in finding us this, um, this option. Uh, it is one tool in the toolkit for integrated uh, pest management. And uh, so, and I think that we, in my experience, at least, um, it, they've, it's been very successful when I worked in uh, agriculture. Uh, we were able to use goats and um, with, with much success. So again, recognizing that this is one piece in a one tool in the toolkit, um, I'm just really thrilled uh, to see this happening and, and moving towards less toxic alternatives. I hope this can become a model for um, other public agencies in our region. And with that, I will ask for a roll call vote on the consent agenda. Hey, before I start that, I do want to note that I did not call on um, Commissioner Tim Gubbins at the beginning, so he is present, and I know that Commissioner uh, Eduardo Montesino has also joined us. <clears throat> so, uh, Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Northcutt? Yes. And Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Rockin? Aye. That's unanimous. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, we now have an opportunity for commissioner reports, uh, oral reports. Any members of the commission want to speak? I see Mr. Rockin, Commissioner Rockin, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I would like to add, uh, had an item on the next uh, RTC agenda to discuss the possibility of the RTC placing a ballot measure on the June election uh, concerning the, the uh, issue about uh, rail and trail issues. I don't want to debate that. It's, the public's not been uh, notified of this discussion today, so I'm not going to get into the substance of it. Simply like to have the uh, item added on the agenda. Um, my concern is that the uh, Greenway measure uh, may not give us a clear indication of exactly what people's views are. There's some, I think it's in some ways a confusing measure. I don't want to uh, argue that you know it's a bad measure or a good measure, or whatever. But I think that it would be, be very helpful to this commission to have a clear statement from the public um, about their views about uh, the future for rail and trail on this corridor. And I'd like that item to add for a full discussion at our next regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. Um, Commissioner Caput. Yeah, I uh, I agree with uh, Mike on that. Uh, I think it would be a good idea. So uh, I, I don't think it needs uh, two people to put it on the uh, agenda. It just needs one, right? Yeah, again, okay. I'm not proposing we discuss its merits right. at this point. People That's may right. think it's a terrible idea. We'll, we'll talk about it at our next meeting. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, just to make sure that we are clear about the process for uh, taking this, uh, making this move uh, for the public and for commissioners, uh, could we get some clarity on uh, the process? Can we uh, just go ahead and, and make that request and make sure it's on our next agenda or should we be taking action? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm looking at the commission's bylaws very quickly now. So if the commission could give me a couple of minutes to do that, I'll, I'll look at that and respond back to that issue. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will um, take the opportunity to say I, I agree. I appreciate the intention and um, am also supportive of putting that item on our agenda for, for public, for discussion uh, in, in the public, with the public. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to remark about the uh, very thoughtful letters, emails that we got from the public, and uh, I appreciate their participation in this decision-making process that we're embarking on. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, w we have a... Uh, uh, recommendation on the floor, not a formal motion. Uh, and while our uh, council, while Mr. Mattis is looking at the bylaws, um, should, should we go ahead and start in on the director's report? Yeah, Madam Chair, I would recommend you do that and just okay. table the issue for a few minutes, then I'll, I'll uh, respond back to the commission, then you can uh, consider. It. Okay. okay, so we will return to that um, item after our director's report. Mr. Preston. You're up. Chair Brown, uh, fellow commissioners and members of the public, I have um, a few informational items today, um, starting with an update on the 2021 consolidated grant cycle. Uh, following the commission's direction at our last uh, meeting to increase funding to the county pavement projects by $2 million, maintain at least $300,000 for the Highway 1 project, and maintain funding for city projects as recommended by staff and committees, staff programmed the balance of funds to the San Lorenzo Valley School Complex Circulation and Access Study. There's an item on today's board agenda regarding that. Uh, Ecology Action Youth Bike Pedestrian Education Program, leaving a balance of 325,000 program to Highway 1. RTC will work with Santa Cruz Metro and Community Bridges Lift Line to identify and promote future grant opportunities for their bus replacements. Um, I have an uh, update on the uh, public meeting for a SoCal Drive um, improvement project. Um, as you're aware, RTC secured $107.2 million grant for three projects that are part of a larger Watsonville to Santa Cruz multimodal corridor plan. 
including bus on shoulders, auxiliary lanes, and bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings on two Highway 1 projects, SoCal Drive Avenue to 41st Avenue and Bay Porter to State Park Drive. In addition to the Highway 1 improvements, the grant included funding for a 5.6 mile long complete streets project on SoCal Drive from La, La Fonda Drive to State Park Drive. This is a multimodal project with the goal of encouraging safe walking, biking, and transit prioritization. The County of Santa Cruz Public Works Department is leading the development of the SoCal Drive project and is seeking public input as part of two virtual public meetings. There will be a virtual meeting on January 20th. A flyer on the virtual meter meetings is attached to my written report. Um, I have an update on the rail line storm damage repair railroad bridge fencing project. <clears throat> uh, the last of RTC's 2017 storm damage repair projects known as Site 7 is scheduled to start construction next week. The work for Site 7 consists of removal and replacement of a portion of the railroad bridge railing over Highway 1 between State Park Drive and Rio Del Mar Boulevard, which was damaged when a tree fell onto the bridge. To safely perform the work, the contractor, Granite Rock Construction, will need to completely close the freeway at night between State Park Drive and Rio Del Mar, with traffic being detoured onto Soquel Drive. Work is scheduled to take place over three nights, Tuesday next week, January 18th through Thursday, January 20th. Northbound lanes will be closed between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., Southbound lanes will be closed between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. I have an, uh, an announcement on the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 1. Each year, Caltrans highlights the best of its work and the work of its partners through the annual Caltrans Excellence in Transportation Awards Program. Caltrans received entries from Caltrans districts and programs, public agencies, private contractors. If I could interject. Commissioner Quinn, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I just got a, I heard a message saying that the recording had stopped. Yes, Henny, can you confirm uh, or confirm that we're still recording? I um, I just heard the same uh, the thing, um, Mr. Mattis. I will check in and see what happened. I'm not sure my uh, comments merit any legacy recording. Recording in but progress. I to say thank you for getting that fence finally fixed. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner Quinn. And I hear that the recording is now back on. Thank you uh, for that. Okay, uh, we will quickly take it up. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin, go with you, and then we'll go out to the public. I just wanted to add to the uh, director's report, uh, since it seems to have gotten overlooked, that uh, uh, the California Coastal Commission approved the uh, consistency determination for uh, the rail trail segment five from uh, Wilder Ranch to um, Davenport with a change in the condition that would have made the, pro the uh, project impossible. So it's a very, um, a very important decision and a very uh, important step forward for this project, which hopefully we'll be seeing um, additional progress over the next few months. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So um, I guess I guess congratulations are in order for fixing a portion of the rail line. Is it my understanding that this is from the damage done to storms from 2017? Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so again, I guess congratulations are in order, but it's been five years. That tells you a little bit something about how onerous it is to kind of wait for federal dollars and the promise that uh, they're going to be there for uh, catastrophic events. Um, uh, again, congratulations, but uh, they should be, I guess, um, in quotation marks because it's been a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, I want to do a quick time check here. Uh, we do have a public hearing scheduled for 930. 
uh, at which I'd like to get started uh, <coughs> time. We have one member of the public who would like to speak on the director's report. So I will call on uh, Brian uh, Peoples, Trail Now, and then we'll uh, thank, do thank a little you. rejiggering of the, of the agenda to thank, accommodate thank, the public hearing. Thank, thank you, I'll be quick. Um, I appreciate um, the time. I want to concur Commissioner Quinn's and Commissioner Johnson's comments about the rail repair. Um, both of those are very poignant. Um, but I do want to comment about the award from Caltrans for the segment seven phase one trail. Um, you know, first of all, want to rec uh, recognize our local staff of public works for work that they're doing because it's hard work. And appreciate that. But I would question what the criteria is for that award because the first week that it opened up, we had somebody crash their bike because of the danger, the narrowness, and the configuration of it hitting the fence and breaking their wrists. This was a an experienced bicyclist that we know, I know. So the configuration of that trail, segment seven, seven is actually very unsafe. You, there's a, a curb that some people fall. Um, and actually the cost of the project was three times over budget. Um, and that portion of the trail was supposed to be the least expensive. And so when we're talking about highlighting a great success of the trail, that one really wasn't that successful when you look at the the safety of it and the configuration and the cost. So I'm hopeful that we don't pat ourselves on the back saying that this is a great example of the trail because it really isn't. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. <clears throat> um, so we are at 9.33 and I'd like to- uh, Can I just make a quick, just like literally for 20 seconds? Go for it. I just want to have a counterpoint to the comments made by Mr. Peoples. I ride, use that trail two, two or three times a week. It's a completely safe and wonderful experience riding along it. And that's the experience of most of the people using it. And the fact that an outside agency looks at it and makes a judgment that it's one of the best projects in the state, I think carries a little more weight than the views of one of our members uh, of the public in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. I, I was resisting my uh, inclination to respond. Um, but yes, I, I, I too have had uh, positive experiences and I have talked with many, many uh, users as well who have. Um, so I want to move on to our public hearing now. We still have uh, a <coughs> response under item 17 uh, to determine how <coughs> we will proceed with putting an item on our February agenda. Uh, Mr. Mattis, do you have a I, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, and I appreciate the, the commission's allowing me the time to look back through the rules and regulations. There is not a minimum requirement of the number of commissioners to put a place an item on the agenda. So if the, if there's a request to place an item on the agenda, it can be placed unless that, you know, unless that request was overridden by the majority of the commission. Okay. Um, do any commission, given that information, do any commissioners have any additional comments? If not, we will uh, go ahead and, and get that placed on our next agenda. All right. Uh, so we, um, Mr. Gubbins, if it's all right with you to um, return to the Caltrans report after we hold our public hearing so we can get that going, uh, that would be great. And I am going to ask our staff, this is the public hearing on the draft 2045 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan, <coughs> item 20 on our agenda for those who are watching. And we will begin with a staff report. Uh, and I believe Amy Naranjo is up. Good morning, thanks for having me. Um, just verifying, can you see the presentation on the screen? Yes. yes. Great. Okay, well, uh, good morning again, members of the commission and members of the public. My name is Amy Naranjo, and I am a transportation planner for the RTC. And today's item requires no action of the board 
The purpose today is solely for a public hearing to gather feedback from the public on the draft release of the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan. So, but here. So prior to the public hearing, I'd like to provide a brief overview of the RTP development process and then share some highlights of the plan for those who are joining us for the first time today. So the RTP is a state mandated long range transportation plan that the RTC is responsible for developing and implementing for Santa Cruz County. The plan is updated every four years and targets federal, state and local resources for transportation investment. The 2045 RTP is fiscally constrained and is a minor update to the work that was done for the 2040 RTP. The regional transportation plan includes three major components, a policy element, a financial element, and an action element. The policy element defines the transportation goals, policies, and performance targets for the Santa Cruz County and guides transportation funding decisions and project prioritization. Uh, these have been developed using a triple bottom line approach with a focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, system preservation, safety, and improving access and equity to ensure that the transportation system works for all users and modes throughout our community. The goals of the 2040 RTP were revised from the 2040 RTP so that they shift the function away from forecasting towards monitoring the real time. The financial element estimates how much transportation revenues will be available for the county over the next 25 years. The revenue forecasts that we have so far are based on 2020 financial data and estimate over $5 billion in revenues that are reasonably anticipated to be available from local, state, and federal sources, including Measure D funds. Most of the revenues are highly restricted and are dedicated for certain projects. And we estimate that 46% of the funds are coming from local sources. And then uh, a quick clarification as well is that the RCC really has only discretion over about 4% of these funds in the total plan. The next element is the action element. And this identifies the complete list of transportation needs in the county through a list of programs and projects that are needed to operate, maintain, and improve the transportation system. Uh, more than 650 projects have been identified in the, in the RTP and with an, with an estimated cost of $9.7 billion over the next 25 years. And projects that are on the constrained list include projects that have dedicated funding, all the projects that have been already programmed, and then projects that have been prioritized for discretionary funding and or semi-flexible funding. Uh, you can see on the screen here that in the project list that we have listed in appendix uh, was it E, um, they have, uh, there's 360 projects that are fully constrained, uh, meaning they have full funding, uh, 150 projects that are partially constrained, and then 290 projects on the list where there's no funding identified. There we go. Uh, the project list also includes various types of projects and programs, such as improvements to highways and local roads, uh, new bike and pedestrian facilities, improved transit service, goods movement, and transportation demand management programs, just to name a few. Uh, you can, again, you can look in the appendix E of the draft plan that has a complete list of all of the projects. The next item here is the in California Environmental Quality Act. The RTP is subject to CEQA and the EIR for this RTP, as well as the RTP for Monterey County and San Benito County have been merged with the EIR for the 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan and the Sustainable Community Strategy prepared by AMBAG. The RTC has been coordinating with AMBAG on the development of this MCP over the, the last couple of years. And we've been identifying, by identifying financial constraints and transportation projects for the county um, for inclusion in the MCP as well. Uh, let's see, and then also the, the EIR analyzes a range of impacts resulting from future development and improvements to the regional transportation network. And the EIR is available to review at AMBAG's website at www.ambag.org. So the next steps, the public comment period for both the RTP and EIR is currently in, uh, in progress. And the deadline for that for comments to be submitted is Monday, January 31st. Um, AMBAG, AMBAG hosted a EIR public workshop yesterday at their board meeting 
and they have three more virtual workshops uh, coming up in the beginning or throughout January. And that's on January 19th, 24th, and 27th. And all of those workshops are starting at 6 p.m. And members of the public can join any one of those workshops. Um, in, the, in, your, uh, in your packet today, there is an attachment with a flyer, and you can use that flyer to get the link to register for a specific workshop that you're interested in. Um, and then the following step is that staff will then, uh, once, the pu once the public comment period closes, staff will begin responding to comments and, and incorporating any changes um, that, in from, that we've received from feedback, and we'll incorporate that into the final 2045 RTP. And then lastly, the adoption of the final 2045 RTP is scheduled for June 2022 at the RTC meeting. So. With that being said, I'm um, I'm happy to go ahead and begin the public uh, public hearing, uh, unless there's any comments from the the board. Um, but here I have on the screen here other ways to stay involved with reading or reviewing our project website at secrtc.org/2045rtp. Um, you can for, uh, members of the public can also join our mailing list to receive updates on the status of the RTC as we move forward towards the final, as well as uh, they can provide input, uh, sending emails, or you can mail us comments. And I'll close my presentation now. Go ahead. I have, I have a comment. I'll wait to be called on. Thank you, Ms. Naranjo. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin. My only comment is that the language that we're using to describe the difference between the projects that have funding available and those that are still without <clears throat> uh, adequate or complete funding is completely counterintuitive and confusing to the public. This was raised at earlier meetings, and I, I really think unless we're required by some state law to use that particular language, um, and even then I'd go to the legislature or whoever made that happen and get them to change it. Because when you say, you know, these projects are constrained or not constrained, it's exactly the opposite of what anybody would believe when they hear that language. Um, we're calling projects that are uh, funded and ready, you know, going to be able to move forward constrained projects. And the ones that are without funding and unlikely to happen without some additional outside funding, unconstrained. And that's ridiculous. So I would really ask our staff to seriously consider finding a just more intuitive and obvious way to describe the difference between those two kinds of um, projects in those two situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, it looks like uh, Commissioner Peterson, you are up. Thank you so much. And um, this is a question that I uh, raised last night at our AMBAG meeting when we were also looking at our transportation plan. Um, and so I'm hoping that this is something that uh, staff can clarify for myself and, and other members of the commission and also members of the public that have asked me this as well. Um, what is required for a project to be moved from the unconstrained to constrained project list? Okay, th thank you, uh, Commissioner Peterson, for the question. If, if we could get a response to that question and and then perhaps uh, something about the lang the requirements around the language that we use as well. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you asked what qualifies for the project to move from the unconstrained to the constrained list. And, and typically it's uh, where, pro where funding has been identified or there's a reasonable expectation that this project can be completed within, within uh, this time frame or have full funding within the time frame. Um, and then we also have the option of that if funding has not been identified for a project at this current time, um, we do re revise the RTP project list every four years. And then when funding has been identified, it can then be added to, to the constrained project list. And then as far as um, the comment, as far as um, updating the language, we can definitely make some clarifications in our language uh, in the draft report that clarifies between unconstrained and constrained projects. Thank you, really appreciate that. If I could say it, it's not a matter of just clarifying what it means. I want the language, it's, I would propose that we actually change the language because it now it tells you, if you read it carefully, you can see what they mean. The problem is why are they have those labels? They're just, again, a constrained project is one that we're going to do, and an unconstrained project is one we're not going to do, and that makes no sense. 
Okay, I, uh, I do see that uh, Director Preston and our Deputy Director, um, Mr. Mendez, have comments. So I'll start with you, Mr. Preston. So um, with regards to Mike's question, unconstrained and constrained, we're using the, the adjective with the wrong object. Um, it's not the project, it's the funding. The funding is either constrained or the funding is unconstrained. So with a constrained funding, we have a limited amount of funding to uh, disperse to all of the projects. Unconstrained funding means there's no constraints on funding. Let's assume we can do everything. And that's why the unconstrained list includes more projects and projects that may not have funding available. Um, the process of trying to divvy up the money is, is challenging. Um, first, they go through a forecast of what they think can reasonably be, be, be brought in. And in doing that forecast, they also have to look at if there are requirements on that funding that it can only be used for transit, it can only be used for highways. So to help answer Commissioner Peterson's question, it's, it's identifying the funding and ensuring that the funding can be used for that particular project. Um, right now, there's some projects that we could move to the constrained list, but we would have to find another project to move onto the unconstrained list and offset the funding. So there's a limited amount of funding. Sometimes the funding is limited to where it can go, but this analysis was done as, as an early stage in the development of the RPP, coming up with the $5 billion. And then that was applied to the individual projects that um, we listed as a county. And whatever couldn't fit on the constrained list, then it could be on the un unconstrained funding list. And I, th I think Louise probably can add more to this too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mendez. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and, and Again, Ms. Uh, Mr. Preston certainly uh, addressed the questions uh, very, very well. Just a couple of minor things to add. Uh, in terms of the uh, in the adjectives of constrained and unconstrained, that is what everybody uses statewide. And so, you know, to kind of try to change change that, um, it, it might be it might be a challenge. But you know, Mr. Preston did did uh, uh, correctly state why it is that we use the constrained and unconstrained because we're looking at it as in terms of the funding. Um, not the projects uh, themselves. And then uh, also with regards to the projects on the constrained or unconstrained list, I think uh, that there might be some, it, it is an exercise as Mr. Preston said, as to you know what projects could potentially be uh, fit in with the funding that's identified to be available. But if a project is on the uh, constrained list, it doesn't necessarily mean that it actually will get built within that time period in the RTP. Because uh, because there are many many other things that that come into play as to whether a project actually uh, comes to fruition, and also if a project is in the unconstrained list, it also does not mean that it will not uh, um, be pursued or that uh, it will not be funded and will and um, and implemented. So there are many examples of projects that were on the unconstrained list, but funding opportunities come for those projects, and so they actually do move forward and and do get. Um, implemented. Thank you uh, to staff for, for those clarifications. So Commissioner Peterson, does that answer your question? It does, yes, thank you. Okay, um, great. And, and then with respect to the terminology, the use of terminology, I think we'll um, have to do some brainstorming about how to make that clarification and uh, Commissioner Rockin, if you'd like to bring something to ask the, the state to change <laughs> the terminology, I'm certainly open to putting that on our agenda as well. Um, but if we can- That, that is to... not my request at this time, <laughs> okay. thank you. Okay, um, but if, if we can try to, um, you know, use some language in the agenda reports that help to, to clarify that, I think it would be great. It, it's thrown me off sometimes too, and I'm just getting used to it, but I know the public uh, would appreciate, or I imagine the public would appreciate that clarity. Um, okay, so it looks like we are ready to um, open up to the public here. And I see uh, three hands up. If you are here and you'd like to talk about our, our 2045 Regional Transportation Plan, uh, please do raise your hands and uh, be 
prepared when your name is called or your number. And uh, we will give two minutes for uh, comment on this item. Uh, we'll start with Brian Trail now. Hi, it's Brian from Trail now. Thank you for taking the time. Um, first of all, I concur with Commissioner Rotkin's comments about constraint and unconstraint. It, it is confusing. And I really like to try to, whenever I, Mr. Rotkin and I are on the same page, I like to recognize that. Not very common. <laughs> but anyways, no, I, I do agree with that. But I do have a specific question about the estimates. Um, it, within the detail estimates, you have segment seven phase two at $11 million. Um, that doesn't seem accurate when you look at the, the costs associated with phase one. Um, segment seven, uh, phase two has significant earth moving work being done, building huge retaining walls, destroying heritage trees, so there's a lot of work associated with it. And when we see the cost of the Manresa storm damage doubling in cost, um, shouldn't it be, when you're putting a plan together, should you not have uh, more realistic numbers in your calculations? Why, why do we only have $11 million for segment 7A phase two, which is from Bay to the wharf? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. I um, will, in an effort to try to get questions answered uh, efficiently here, I'm going to just keep notes on questions that arise and see if we can get those answered at the end of the uh, public hearing uh, so that people can can continue to, to provide their input and uh, we'll revisit. So um, next up, I see uh, Joni Steele. And you are muted. Ms. Steele, if you are um, calling from your phone, you would press star six or you need otherwise need to unmute yourself to uh, be able for us to hear you. Okay, I think we'll um, move forward and um, can return to Ms. Steele if you are able to unmute uh, in the future here. Uh, Mark Masidi Miller, you're next. Greetings, Chair Brown and Commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm here today representing the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. I want to thank you and your staff for assembling this massive document. I will make some brief comments today, but please know Fort will be submitting additional written comments. The 2045 goals, targets, and policies cited in Appendix C of the draft RTP provide an excellent overview of our hopes for a more energy efficient and less congested future. They include state mandates to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation sources to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030 and to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. Global warming is already drastically changing our local and worldwide climate in ways that will cause immense turmoil and suffering in the coming years. Locally, we are intimately familiar with multi-year droughts horrific wildfires and eroding shorelines. The science is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions are the primary cause of global warming and locally, transportation is the biggest contributor. So while the RTP goals are laudable, the draft RTP itself does not rise to the occasion. In fact, the plan does not anywhere make the link between its extensive project list and how these projects will achieve the plan's goals. In conclusion, Fort strongly encourages the commission to recommit to its identified goals, targets, and policies 
and to prioritize a list of projects that will actually achieve those goals. Our health and well being and that of all our descendants truly depends on your choices today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masidi Miller. Rebecca Downing, you are up. Thank you. Good morning. Um, both the executive summary and strategy section state, quote, this plan is required to analyze where people are going and how they want to get there in order to build a transportation network that addresses the mobility and accessibility needs of the region, unquote. And then it continues to note associated strategies, including focusing on growth in transit corridors and offering more travel choices and increased efficiencies in the current transportation system. These strategies address where people are going, but not how they want to get there. I have asked at your previous meetings to conduct more comprehensive outreach to determine both where and how residents wish to travel. If this work has been done throughout our region, it should be included in the plan. If not, I ask you to request inclusion and reporting of its work in the 2045 plan so it reflects the desires of those who will be affected by its projects. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downing. Uh, Todd Marco, your turn. Hi, thanks. I'm executive director for Nicene Rio Gateway, a new nonprofit with a mission to promote and improve the parks and pathways in Aptos. Aptos is a unique and special location in our county. It is positioned roughly midway between the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, and the newly redeveloped Aptos Village serves as an incredible gateway to our spectacular redwood forest and expansive coastline. It is also a critically important location for regional transportation. It currently functions as a pinch point or bottleneck, often referred to as the Aptos Strangler. Our county's three main transportation corridors all converge near Aptos Village. Here in Aptos, we are an unincorporated community. As such, we lack basic accommodations like sidewalks and bike lanes that are common in incorporated areas. With support from RTC and partner agencies, there is an opportunity to transform Aptos from a transportation choke point to a transportation hub. The convergence of Highway 1, SoCal Drive, and the rail corridor present incredible potential to improve safety and access throughout our community. Substantial improvements for active transportation in the Aptos would greatly improve recreational, economic, and health benefits throughout our community. I ask that the priorities and importance of transportation improvements through Aptos be appropriately reflected in the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan. Thanks. Okay, hey, thank you, Mr. Marco. I will now call on Equity Transit. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair Sandy Brown. I've lived in Santa Cruz since the 1990s and I'm an avid cyclist and past youth biking coach. Equity Transit supports the award-winning Coastal Rail Trail as approved and we are excited about our trail that is in progress now. I'd like to also appreciate the RTC staff for its incredible work on the pedestrian and bike overpasses being developed at Chanticleer and Mar Vista and the new vehicle bridge across the Capitola Avenue. And having safe car-free passage across the freeway will encourage and enhance our community's ability to safely access work and shopping without having to drive. Equity Transit appreciates the RTC staff incredible work on segment five of the rail trail recently approved by the California Coastal Commission to be built on the ocean side of the tracks from Wilder to Davenport. That work the RTC staff did in applying for grants for segment five was fantastic, resulting in fast tracking, opening the segment of the trail, which for many of us who bike regularly to Davenport are excited to not have to risk our lives riding side by side with the Mack trucks along Highway 1. And also congratulations on segment seven rail trail Caltrans Excellence in Transportation Award. Um, you've been doing a lot of work on the trail. We appreciate it. Equity Transit is op in opposition to the widening of Highway 1 from State Park Drive from Freedom Boulevard, which has been placed on the list for funding and would like to see it removed from funding. This project would require huge sums of money, which we simply do not have, as it has been said by the executive staff, whenever mentioning funding for public rail transit to be shunted away from prioritizing our public rail. 
The RTC's very own studies, including the TCAA, have shown that money should be prioritized into supporting and expanding robust public transit systems, including electric light rail and e-buses, not spent on widening highways further, which will um, cause future uh, monies to go shunting towards improvements. Um, connecting cities across the state of California via the state rail plan is key in mitigating our environmental crisis. And um, we hope that highway might widening between State Park and Freedom Boulevard will be removed as uh, part of the triple bottom line of equity, environment, and the economy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, next up, we have Sally for Rail and Trail. Hi, am I unmuted? You are. Yay, okay. So um, like other people, I just really appreciate what the RTC has done with this very long and complicated document. Um, I see you have a lot of balls in the air, a lot of things to balance. Um, regarding the specific project list, we specifically note that while many pages of that draft plan include references to statewide sustainability, transit, rail plans, policies, our own rail public transit project on the RTC owned coastal rail line is highlighted only in as much as, and this is a quote, on the financially unconstrained list of projects due to a lack of identified and likelihood of available funding to the region for a passenger rail project, end quote. Now, most of the projects on the draft RTP do not have their actual funding sources identified during the project development stage. And our rail transit project in, in particular um, actually has over 60% of the estimated high-end capital costs identified as likely. Um, this is that's unlike any of the highway one widening projects and most other projects for that matter. And this is due to the heavy and ana extensive analysis that's been done over the past decades. I feel like this document demonstrates the tenacity of car centric fossil fuel fed paradigm. We can plan for highways with no idea how it's going to be paid for, but public rail transit, oh, that requires a much higher threshold of certainty. Please reflect carefully on the double standard that's being applied to these different projects and align the projects as Mr. Miller and, um, and Ms. Faulkner said, with the goals. If the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then as much money as possible needs to be put to those projects that would do it and away from projects that would increase car use. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Barry Scott. Okay, thank you. Uh, and boy, thank you, Sally, for, for pointing out how rail transit has funding identified, more funding identified, uh, potential funding than highways. Uh, I want to congratulate the RTC for uh, their successful presentation before the Coastal Commission for the Northern segment. It's interesting to point out that it was the, in part, the fact that the rail line is active and not rail banked that they decided to keep the trail on the coastal side and drop what was condition four. Um, for the RTP, I want to uh, ask that attention be paid to regional plans and so that we are understanding what the our, our long range plans for AMBAG and for our or for the state as regards uh, rail infrastructure, as well as Measure D uh, allocations, which after all, that was put to a public vote and supported by 67% of the voters that we would be spending money on rail maintenance, planning, and on the coastal rail trail. And I think it's important when we talk about what's constrained and what's not, what's unconstrained, when our funding agencies look at what our plans are and they don't see a commitment on a, toward a particular project, that doesn't really communicate much, much hope to them. Our, our chances of qualifying for funding are going to be higher where we demonstrate a commitment toward pursuing that project. And to that end, I hope we will show more dedication to public transit, to rail transit, and less to highways, for goodness sake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Diane D., you are up. Okay, I hope you can hear me. We can. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
I think it's important to realize that um, this county really needs an energy efficient transit system. Um, most residents and visitors would would support that. They they want energy efficiency and reduction of greenhouse gases. They want less congestion. Um, they want improvements in transportation that will be available to everyone, not just people who can ride bikes or walk. Uh, and I want to point out that a I want to pose a question. How will the, the projects that are listed in the draft plan help with reducing greenhouse gases? Um, how will, uh, due to the fact that their transportation is the biggest contributor to the climate crisis, what are we, what are we doing and planning and funding and finding funds available to, to make uh, a reduction in greenhouse gases for all of these projects? Uh, I think our plan should demonstrate a commitment to that in every aspect of the plan. I want you, the commissioners, and all of our elected officials to think of the future of our county. Think of the future residents and visitors to our county and how they want to get around, how all of them can get around equitably. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jack Brown, you're up. Hi, just a quick comment. I um, kind of appreciate what uh, Diane B was just saying uh, about equity and uh, also about reducing greenhouse gases. Um, I think that we have to look at any of these solutions here being equitable um, has to include the entire county. Um, and one of the, the big issues with, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the, uh, the rail advocates here, you know, just saying that that's, that's equitable. It's not accounting for many of the communities throughout the county that can't access a rail solution. And if we look at a rail solution, you know, it's the scalability of it. When we've already seen in the UCIS and the TCAA, the ridership numbers show that it would have a very minimal impact on traffic in the county. And also with, you know, now having, you know, trains going across, you know, nearly three dozen intersections with 2,100 traffic interruptions a day, if we have 60 trains a day, that'll actually contribute more to greenhouse gas. Um, so I think we have, to, we have to look a little bit better. I think, you know, the, the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation was really leaning more towards real bus on shoulder rather than bus on auxiliary lane. Um, and I tend to agree with them and really hoping that there would be more emphasis in this uh, plan to do that more than, you know, uh, having a, a auxiliary lane type work um, and to dedicate any uh, highway one expansion to public transit. Um, so anyway, just wanted to, to put those extra comments out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I see more hands coming up, so we will keep moving through here. Uh, Ryan Sarnataro, you're up. Uh, yes, um, the, the RTC studied the kind of traffic there would be on a, a rail line, and it came in at about 6,000 trips a day. You've got 100,000 on, uh, on the freeway, so it would seem that you're priority as far as improving transportation is going to be on the freeway. The idea that a train will actually operate on that line is at this point becoming so far-fetched that what the RTC really needs to do is to stop any funding whatsoever that is train-oriented. That is uh, I, I believe the RTC has spent a good $10 million on train-only improvements to the line over the course of the last 10 years, and that money really could have been used for something a lot better. And so getting some clarity about the long-term future of transportation in Santa Cruz County is very important. And I think that part of that clarity has to do with eliminating from our 
menu of choices, options that have such a long tail chance of success and provide so little utility and equity to the community that they really don't deserve any more funding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarnataro. Uh, Sean Shrum, I'm getting that right. Uh, you are up next. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz's own, uh, uh, own Mr. Shrum, we, you're breaking up. We're having a, just wanted to let you know we're having a hard time hearing you. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a signal issue, but I, I just want to make sure your comments are heard. So letting you know. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind setting the clock, uh, power outage in my, uh, in my, can you all hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, remind everyone, um, as far as funding goes, how fortunate we are to have Anna Eschew as our congressional representative. She's helped secure $5,147,000,000 specifically for Caltrain, for crossings and bridges, electrifying their buses, uh, roads and other infrastructure. Now, she has a, she has a call every week. And if, and if you email or call her office, she will respond personally. So there's no chance for anybody to lie about about this, you know, or about or about funding. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Shrum. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I just want to, with the redistricting, and I agree with the uh, recent speaker that, uh, about Anna Eshoo's um, success with uh, providing funding for us, but uh, she's no longer. Uh, will no longer be our congressional representative. It'll be Jimmy Panetta in Santa Cruz County. So uh, I, I want to appreciate Shirley, and I've worked well with uh, uh, Congresswoman Eshoo, but uh, Jimmy Panetta is our, will be our Congress member um, when the redistricting is finalized for the next election. Thank you, sad, Commissioner. Sad but true. McPherson, yes, sad but true. I, that was going through my mind as you were speaking, as Mr. Shrum was speaking. Um, for now, we can or we can continue to celebrate the the achievements and and what the work she's done with our community. Um, let's see. I don't see any other hands up, and and this is a pub time for a public hearing. So before I bring it back, I just want to do a last call, and um, in particular, I wanted to see um, Joni Steele. I see you're still on, and you did have your hand up. So I wanted to just give you a chance if you were still intending to speak before we bring it back and, and Commissioner Rock and I've got you, uh, I'll call on you first. And I am not hearing from Ms. Steele. So uh, Commissioner Rotkin. Yeah, very briefly, um, Ryan Sartano made the comment that, you know, we had spent, uh, I'll take his estimate, I don't know that it's accurate, but to something like $10 million on improving rail over the next, over the past 10 years. Um, it should be noted that we're not repairing the rail with those funds, we're repairing the underlying uh, bridges and culverts and washouts and that's uh, improvement work that would be important for both the trail and the rail. Doesn't matter what side you are on that dispute. So it, it's a mis kind of misleading to suggest that we've been throwing money into a train uh, as opposed to improving the corridor. So some kind of transportation could be carried on it. It's a point worth making, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hurst. Yes, thank you. I think it's really important to have a good plan and have a flexible plan as well. A plan that actually gets people moving and gets goods moving as well. You know, every time that uh, you can uh, load a freight car uh, with uh, containers it helps uh, the supply chain and, and alleviates some of the backup at ports and manufacturers and warehouses and, and takes semis off the road. We all see a lot of semis on the road, and so there's a way to get semis off the road. It's, uh, it's been proven uh, historically. And so we're, we're glad to see that there's a plan 
but the plan needs to be more encompassing to move freight as well as people. And Watsonville has been the center of freight in the past. It's certainly the uh, hub of uh, transportation with Highway 1, Highway 152, and Highway 129. So it's important to fix the freeway, but let's also invest in our rail infrastructure. You don't have far to go across the river to see the uh, massive rail yard in Pajaro Junction and the importance of uh, uh, the passenger service that does through flow through Pajaro. So I say, let's get a plan. Let's get a plan that gets everybody moving and uh, really remember who needs to be moved and what needs to be moved. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Too short. Uh, well, one point, one question. Um, you didn't, uh, Madam uh, Chair, you didn't close the public hearing. So I think procedurally, it would be probably a good idea to do that. Um, I had a question for staff that came out of the Coastal Commission's consideration of the segment set, uh, five. And uh, it came up that the, the, the RTP would be um, uh, revised to include a project, a long-term project uh, for uh, the, be the for Davenport, the Davenport Beach area. And I wonder if that's been included in the plan and whether that would have any effect on the EIR. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'll um, I'll take this opportunity to, I was just thinking as folks were talking that I had not officially closed the public hearing portion and I will, so I'll go ahead and, and do that. And I think it was actually 10, 15 uh, when we moved back over to commissioners. Uh, could we, uh, is somebody from staff, Amy, um, Ms. Naranjo or Mr. Preston able to respond to Commissioner Schifrin? I see Ms. Blakesley has turned on her camera and so maybe that's you. <laughs> Morning commissioners. Yes, we're working on adding that project to the regional transportation plan. You should see it in the final draft version um, that will be presented to the public. Um, I would have to get back to you if it has an impact on the overall environmental document, but it would be considered um, in the revision for the final EIR. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Quinn. Thank you, Chairperson. I found the comments very interesting. And as a new commissioner, it's really helpful to hear from the public and look at these plans. What I'd like to encourage us is, is use the data to help guide these really difficult decisions. Uh, I think someone earlier made the very clear point that we don't have infinite dollars, we have limited dollars. To Commissioner Rockin's point about building or restoring the rail right of way is the same whether or not you do a train. It's actually not true. As uh, Ms. Christensen reported in the excellent report on the Capitola Bridge, there really are significant expenditure differences as to what your standards are for restoring, restoring the infrastructure, whether you do it for trail, for freight or for passenger. And I think those kinds of uh, data-driven uh, analytics need to be factored into our decision. Uh, and then the final thing is, you know, we, we seem to be embracing the concept that the train would significantly reduce the traffic on Highway 1. And my recollection of the RTC studies is the numbers is somewhat south of 5%. But if someone could confirm that number for me, I'd be grateful just so we have a frame of reference when we're talking about how, how uh, the train would mitigate Highway 1. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Quinn. Um, is there someone on staff who'd like to speak directly to that question uh, regarding the study and of projected use for the different modalities? Mr. Preston. Sure, sure I can give it a try. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, Commissioner Quinn, but it was, um, there's been a couple studies where we've looked at ridership. Um, the 2015 feasibility study, I think, um, projected around 5,000 riders per day. And the um, transit corridor alternatives analysis, I think, was in, in the 7,000 range. And that, that would be um, boardings. So if, if you're looking at round trips, you'd divide that in half. Um, and, and then uh, Highway 1 traffic um, is about 100,000 uh, cars a day. So in terms of percentages, I think you were, you were fairly accurate. 
And so, I mean, not. I think the the, glim, the global climate is a huge issue we want to factor. Uh, we do have finite resources and reducing highway one traffic two to 3% in a county that represents 1% of the population in a state that represents 10% uh, of the population of the country. I mean, not, not to be dogmatic, but I, I think we need to be uh, make the biggest impact we can and be mindful of how we do that. We also haven't factored in how much the bottleneck on highway one actually makes each car traffic uh, much less efficient than it could be. Okay, so I don't see any other commissioners hands up and um, I do wanna keep us moving. Um, if we could just, I, I heard one of the questions uh, that came up at the beginning or one of the statements was related to cost estimates for uh, particular uh, segments of the rail line. And, and my understanding is that uh, cost estimates um, kind of as with any project transportation and, uh, and other projects are based on the you know, best information that staff has a, available at the time. And, um, you know, so, and, the, and those do change cost overruns happen. And we know that construction costs are, are significantly increasing um, sort of sometimes wildly. And, and so it, it, that, that can be a challenge challenge to, um, you know, create those those projections, but I, I I don't know if staff wants to say anything more about it, how it was, you. It was specifically seven B. I think the person was commenting. On. Yeah, sure. Yes, it was. So it was uh, the second segment seven B, and I'll mention Manresa as well as um, you know, and and other segments that had cost that had higher costs. So yeah, if you could just uh, speak to how you go about making those projections and. Give, give the public a little bit more uh, info. Thanks. Right. So, uh, in, in getting the project cost, we work um, we work with the project sponsors to get the information for each specific project. Um, and the project sponsors are the ones who are developing their cost estimate and providing us the best information they have at the time it's given. Um, and so, during this time between the the draft RTP and the final RTP, we put out a call again to project sponsors if if they do have um, updated costs to send us that information so that by the time we get to the final draft, we, we are putting forward the best numbers possible. Um, and so I, I will check again to see if there's any updates on that specific project, um, but I haven't received any updates from project sponsors on that project. I have for other projects. And so as we move forward with the final draft um, and I'll make, I'll make some updates on what projects have been updated. Thank you, Ms. Naranjo. And, and yeah, give, this is a project, this particular segment that was highlighted is in the city of Santa Cruz. And I am aware that our uh, public works staff is, you know, is closely close in touch with on this and, and we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted as well. So appreciate that. Um, okay, I think we have, we are now, um, We've closed the public hearing portion. We've heard from commissioners. Are there any other commissioners who um, want to weigh in before we move on uh, or, or back rather to item 19, um, our Caltrans report? Just a reminder to everybody, this was a, an information item. We have a, a public hearing, no action to be taken. So, um, we can move on without any motions and uh, give Mr. Gubbins the floor. Thank you, Chair, uh, members of the board and public. Um, not, not a lot of announcements today. I did want to echo the, um, the Excellence in Transportation Award. It was for multimodal and you know connecting it. So I think that's, that's very, very nice to get that statewide recognition for the local work that was done. Um, other announcements, there's been a lot of information coming out on the budget side. The governor has released his budget earlier this week. Um, there's still a long way to go before that becomes this adapted state budget in June, but for transportation, there's it's voting very well. Um, additional funding and especially together with the federal infrastructure bill that was recently passed, um, it, it does bode well, and the emphasis at both the state and federal level 
have been for um, new alternative or not new, but increased alternative modes so that we get away from some of the just pure car centric. It all, there's also emphasis in both the state and federal for increasing safety. And lastly, both have um, specific funding for ZEVs or zero emission vehicles. So looking at the electrification of some of the fleets out there and how we can get charging at various places will be a continued emphasis. Um, also included in the governor's budget was renewed funding for the Clean California program. And I just wanted to put a reminder out there. I'm pretty sure all of the member agencies, your staffs have been working on various um, project submittals, but for the Clean California grants for local roads, those are due February 1st. And there's been some workshops and explanations of what type of projects qualify for that. Um, this is the winter, even though we might not be able to tell it this week, last month, I think we all uh, noticed again, in this county, we we're fairly fortunate that some of the uh, burn scars were not as affected. The storm came a little bit more southerly than we had anticipated. Um, the Big Sur area did once again get, get hit with a lot of rain and we had some temporary closures there. Everything is now open with just um, some temporary daytime closures that might last up to an hour for traffic. But other than that, the entire route and the entire district is open. And lastly, in your packet are various project updates. Um, I won't go over any in specific, but would be happy to answer any questions on anything I have mentioned or other questions the board members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Govins. Are there commissioners who have questions about the Caltrans report and or the, uh, the written uh, report that has the list of projects. Um, I see uh, Yesenia Ms. Parra has a hand up. If yes, um, Chair Brown, we received a call in our office this morning, right before we started the meeting from a community member who was hoping to make a comment on this particular item, but does not have access to a computer and her phone. Um, the carrier that she has or the program that she's in doesn't allow her to dial um, 800 numbers. So I do have her comment and I wondered if you, how you wanted to handle this request. Uh, if, if you, thank you for that. Uh, if you have it available and are willing to read it for the commission, that would be great. Okay. <clears throat> So I do not have the community member's name. She, uh, the, uh, the community member did not want to give us their name. So um, they said, please provide a written response to Supervisor McPherson and the SEC RTC regarding the two following issues involving safety of our neighborhood and equity in our treatment by Caltrans District 5. Caltrans rejected our request for restrictive fencing along Highway 1 South on ramp to curtail the drug dealing on 17 North and Highway 1 South on ramp, which bleeds into our neighborhood. The first request was please forward the uh, traffic safety engineering report regarding the Plymouth Street median and the dangers of what is called parallel fences to Supervisor McPherson. Um, I contacted uh, Caltrans employees and told them that they needed a gate about 1.5 years ago, which was installed on March 7, 2021. Caltrans trucks crews now have no problem performing maintenance and tree work in this area. A restrictive fence along the top would have no impact on their duties. The recommendations I received from CHP and, Pub and PD advocating for restrictive fencing were from boots and uh, boots on the ground, not admins. As the officers noted, the solution to the mania at River and Nine was solved with the fence. Regarding the responses about the lack of drug evidence is hilarious, ask the PD and the CHP who helped clean out Pharmacy Island on 17 North. The second request, how are you going to make my neighbors and my family feel safe now? When are you going to do something to make our neighborhood safer? One month, three months, six months. Who is going to do it? Who will make the plan? Who do we talk to if you won't do it? 
that there's a lot more detail and I will put that in our comments um, at our next month's uh, correspondence log. Thank you, Ms. Para. Uh, Mr. Govins, did you want to respond to that right now? Um, yeah, let me give a very short response now. And then I would ask if we could receive that comment in writing, if you know, email it over to us so we can get it in. Because I, I believe I'm aware of it. I, that was a fairly lengthy comment. And I don't think I captured everything. So I don't want to try and address it verbally. But we were contacted by a member of the public and then looked into some things and responded. Um, it sounds like our response was not what they were looking for. So I will, I will take the information that you have received. We will follow up again. And um, I heard Mr. Uh, Supervisor McPherson's office reference, so we will touch base with them as well. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, I um, I see Ms. Uh, Commissioner McPherson, you have your hand up. Um, I wanted yes. to just, is it okay, uh, Commissioner Hurst, if, if Commissioner McPherson responds since it's about this one? Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Lowell, let me go ahead. Thank you, I, I am familiar with this. Uh, we have received this and we've been in communication. I, I know it's in the Cal, I'm not passing the buck, but it's in the Caltrans right of way and the CHP is the enforcer of these types of issues. Um, we have looked into it. We have communicated with um, uh, Mr. Govins and as usual, uh, because we great, get great response and clarity from uh, Caltrans and I appreciate that. And I know it will be the same on this one. So thank you for your response. Um, I don't think it's correct for me to try to respond at this point, but um, we'll be in communication with Mr. Govins and Caltrans and uh, we'll discuss this issue further. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Hurst, thank you for your patience. You're up. Uh, thank you. Patience is a virtue, and uh, we, we all try to be more virtuous. I want to thank Mr. Gubbins for his uh, work uh, on uh, the uh, right of ways, particularly litter cleanup in uh, South County along Highway 1, uh, Highway uh, 129, and uh, Highway 152. Also, the um, landscape improvements that uh, are planned for uh, uh, the, the within the city limits of Watsonville, particularly, but uh, all along the uh, right of way, there's uh, some you know shrubbery replacement and some other uh, landscape improvements that uh, are much needed. Uh, so that leads us to some fence repairs. Uh, the um, the 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 fence uh, that uh, is adjacent to the uh, Struve Slough uh, Highway 1, it's often cut uh, and transients uh, are sometimes encamped along those. And I'm sure the uh, transient encampments are an issue everywhere. And I appreciate Caltrans's uh, uh, cooperation and help in uh, making sure we have a secure, clean and uh, attractive environment. That's it for me, thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Hurst, did you want uh, to get a response right now or were you, um, something, it sounded like a comment Wait, for now. Well, it, it's a question, when will we see landscape improvements, fencing uh, repair and uh, more litter cleanup? But we want to express our appreciation for all that has been done and look forward to more. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I will get back to you on exa exact uh, details on the landscape. As you, as you know, there is some in the works to still be coming. Fencing repair, especially near encampments, is very hard to keep on track of. Um, sometimes it's been cut the same afternoon that we had repaired it in the morning. But we, I will bring that 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 location to my uh, crew's attention again. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Govins, for the report and answering questions. We are. Let's see. I I guess I should ask if uh, any members of the public have any comments or questions for our Caltrans representative. And I, I do not see any hands up. I will move us along then to item 21. This is uh, the San Lorenzo Valley Schools Complex Circulation Project, uh, an MOU with local and state agencies and Brianna Goodman. 
uh, and Sarah Christensen, our transportation planner and engineer, uh, senior transportation engineer, are up. Not sure who wants to start. Ms. Goodman, I see you're. Morning, commissioners. Off um, mute. Can I have it. the slides put up, please? Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Brianna Goodman of your staff and lead on implementation of the Highway 9 SLV Complete Streets Corridor Plan. Next slide, please. Since its acceptance in 2019, there has been significant progress in implementing the SLV plan, primarily through collaboration with Caltrans on Caltrans and RTC funded efforts listed on the slide, as well as Caltrans led installation of the rapid flashing beacons at five SLV crosswalks, funded by an HSIP grant secured by RTC. RTC has also secured support from congressional, well, I guess, former congressional representative Anna Eshu for funding nearly $3 million. She, she's not gone yet. She's still your representative. Not gone yet. Yeah. <laughs> for funding nearly $3 million of complete streets elements in Boulder Creek. But unfortunately, all appropriations and earmarks were cut from the final federal infrastructure bill. Next slide, please. Collectively, improving safety and facilities for all modes around the SLV elementary, middle, and high schools in Felton, which I will refer to collectively as the SLV schools complex, are the highest priority projects for SLV community members. After many years of discussion, this MOU and its contribution to the SLV schools complex circulation and access study would create real headway towards addressing the concerns on this section of the Highway 9 corridor. Next slide, please. Lack of dedicated pedestrian or bicycle facilities connecting the SLV schools complex to nearby neighborhoods has been a concern of the SLV community for many years, in particular connection of the schools to Felton in the South. Caltrans is working to provide such facilities through their safety project, which is currently in the project approval and environmental document phase. Next slide, please. The partnership formalized by this MOU and its subsequent collaborative work with the five agency team would build on the Caltrans project to deliver improvements for all modes along an additional 1.1 miles of Highway 9, as well as improve internal circulation on the SLV schools campus and enhance Metro transit stop facilities that serve the campus. Next slide, please. The SLV schools complex circulation and access study will gather data, develop preliminary engineering schematics, conduct a traffic analysis, and conduct a feasibility and needs assessment for improving multimodal system performance along Highway 9 in Felton and within the complex. A request for proposals has been issued and staff will return with a recommendation to award a contract in the spring. Next slide, please, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Um, Ms. Christensen, did you have anything to add before we go to questions and comments? Um, no, Brianna, you did a great job. Um, this has been a, a collaborative effort uh, between five um, agencies and um, we're continuing to collaborate um, constantly with the, the school district. We're actually going to the school district next week to make a similar presentation. Um, and uh, this type of unique project, it really takes um, resources from all parties and collaboration from all parties. And um, so far it's been successful as uh, we have negotiated this MOU successfully with, with the five parties and um, recommending today the approval of this MOU to the commission. Um, it really reflects the collaborative effort that we've been working on over the past several years on this corridor. So thank you, Chair Brown. Thank you. It's great work. I know that kind of coordinate, that level of coordination uh, can be challenging and uh, really appreciate everything you've done. Uh, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam up. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I really want to express uh, and repeat my deep thanks to the RTC staff, especially Brianna Goodman and Sarah Christensen, uh, San Lorenzo San Valley Schools, uh, Superintendent Chris uh, Jeremiah, and uh, its own school board, uh, Metro, San Lorenzo Valley Citizen Transportation Advocates. Um, they've been working on this for years to get to this milestone. As was mentioned, the, the traffic congestion in front of the combined uh, SLV uh, school campus on Highway 9 has been 
a problem for decades, really. It's like a parking lot uh, in the morning and afternoon there, and the circulation on campus has not helped in terms of the efficiency of the safety. So it's critical that we get the cooperative effort with the San Lorenzo Valley School District. They, in their bond measure that they had recently, uh, traffic improvements uh, in that on that campus that serves everyone from kindergarten through high school <clears throat> was mentioned. Um, and whenever I've talked to residents about traffic issues in my nine years as county supervisor, uh, the traffic congestion and, and the lack of uh, sustainable transportation options for the kids on uh, and around the campus are their primary concerns. Um, the cooperative planning process can't be overstated, but it's going to allow the transfer, public transportation agency to uh, develop a master plan and improve the campus circulation entering and leaving the campus on Highway 9 and make sure, making sure that the metro uh, bus stop is uh, positioned appropriately better for better traffic flow. Um, this this uh, had a specific allocation, Measure D, uh, it was addressed in this uh, monetary um, stipend was uh, included in that. I just want to thank uh, the commission and uh, the voters uh, of measure that approved Measure D for this. And uh, this is a critical measure. We had one fatality there, as I know everybody has um, a couple of years ago that they're aware with and uh, aware of. And um, I'm really excited to see this moving along. And again, want to thank all of the five agencies that have been involved in this. Uh, this is not an easy task, and they're each and every one of them are to be congratulated for uh, their input and their efforts in making this become a reality. So thank you very much for getting us to this point. Right, and and I'll I'll add my my thanks to Com Commissioner McPherson for all of your work to, um, you know, facilitate and participate in that coordinated effort. Um, and I, you know, it looks like things are really moving in a very positive direction. So appreciate want to appreciate you as well. Are there other commissioners who wanted to ask any questions before we take it out to the public? Okay, I'm um, taking it out to the public. I do not see any hands up, and I see one hand up. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Brian Largue, your Mr. turn. Mr. Brian. Hi, uh, yes, uh, Brian Largue here. I live in Felton, and uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude to the Regional Transportation Commission, uh, the school district, uh, and other partners, Caltrans, uh, and, and the Board of Supervisors for the support uh, of this project. Uh, we have about 20,000 vehicle trips a day going past the tri-campus. This campus uh, has three uh, schools on it, almost 2,000 students, and uh, regularly, as Supervisor McPherson mentioned, uh, substantial traffic jams. So we have rush hour traffic backed up as uh, all these students are coming and going. It makes it really hard uh, and dangerous to walk or bike to school, uh, which is in, in part one of the solutions to the traffic problem. Uh, a lot of people drive their kids to school because it's not safe for the kids to walk or bike. And so we have even more vehicles getting into that mess. Uh, at any rate, this is the kind of regional uh, problem and complex interagency problem that the Regional Transportation Commission is so well suited to, to help solve. And uh, as a member of the community, I just want to express our gratitude uh, to the leadership uh, uh, and the staff uh, working on this. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll now return to the Commission for Action. I'd like to move the recommended actions, please. I'll second those. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner McPherson and a second by Commissioner Rotkin. I don't see any hands up for comments, so we'll call for a roll call vote on this item. Commissioner Bertrand? I approve. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commission Alternate Hernandez? Yes. Commission Alternate Schifrin? 
Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. And Commissioner Alternate Pegler? Aye. That's unanimous. Okay. We'll now move on to item 22. This is con a construction contract award for phase one of the coastal erosion repair at Manresa on the Santa Cruz branch rail corridor. And Sarah Christensen will provide a staff report. Thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, my name is Sarah Christensen of your staff. Uh, here today to recommend uh, wrote the award of a construction contract for the first phase of a coastal erosion effort um, out near Manresa State Beach along the branch line. Um, I did prepare a short PowerPoint, so I'm gonna share that on my screen now. Can I get some thumbs up if you could hear me? Or if you could see the, okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so in, I'll give a little background about uh, this project. Here's a project location map, um, which shows the phase one project denoted by the yellow arrow. Um, this is near uh, the Manresa State Beach parking lot is shown to the right of the screen. And the La Selva trestle, which was constructed in 2012 is shown towards the left of the screen. Um, I gave a presentation back in August to the commission about this area. Uh, this is a multi-phase, multi-year effort that we're looking at. Um, there's significant erosion um, and challenges that we have at um, this area of the branch line. Uh, the first phase of which is being addressed by this construction contract. It's the most critical uh, coastal erosion um, of the area. Uh, followed closely by the phase two project, uh, which is the repair of a failed drainage cross culvert to uh, the north. And then of course, uh, the remaining coastal erosion um, will be addressed in future phases as um, resources become available. So just a little background, in December of 2019, staff observed the erosion originally as part of a preventative maintenance inspection. Uh, we do those a uh, minimum of twice a year uh, just to monitor some of the critical areas and note any uh, additional repairs that are needed. Um, in January 2020, we had a contractor go out and install temporary soil cover uh, that's a temporary measure to stop the erosion uh, so that we have enough time to design and construct the permanent repair. In June 2020, we started the design of this project using an on-call engineering consultant, RailPros. Uh, and back in August, as I mentioned, um, the RTC oh. adopted the plans and specs of the project, um, and that's when um, I showed the, the map of the corridor and uh, in Google Earth and gave you kind of a tour of the area. In December, the project was advertised. We opened bids last week, uh, which I'll get further into. Um, here's a picture of the temporary soil cover. This is, um, it's basically sandbags and uh, plastic cover and that um, stops the erosion from happening by um, basically any kind of rain or, or drainage flowing over it um, would be, it would be protected by um, the plastic cover. The scope of this project is uh, to install a retaining wall. Uh, the wall is about 70 feet long with a varied height. The maximum height is about 10 feet tall. The project also includes a chain link fence about 1300 feet long. Um, the reason for the chain link fence is because of the foot traffic that's experienced down here. A lot of times folks will try to traverse the steep coastal bluff and the foot traffic really does a number on the 
uh, erosion and it kind of speeds up the erosion of the bluff. And so this chain link fence is really a preservation measure um, to hopefully delay the need to um, repair the um, remaining erosion out there. We are regrading the inland side ditch. Um, the drainage system out there is not flowing very well. It's contributing to the erosion problems that we have. And so the project includes about a thousand feet of ditch regrading and um, unclogging of a drainage culvert that's under the existing access driveway. And that's gonna help reestablish the drainage system out there. Here's a photo of the um, standing water in the ditch to the right. So you can see uh, the bluff is on the left and the ditch is on the right. So this is gonna be addressed by the repair as well. So the engineer's estimate for this project was $320,600 and that was based on historic unit prices. Uh, we opened bids last week and we received two bids. Uh, the lowest bid was $634,100. The other bid was close to that, um, a little bit higher, uh, but it, it's a good sign when your bids are um, close because that means there's no, there's usually not any uh, variances or mistakes in the bids. Uh, so that's a good sign. Um, <coughs> The bad news is the bid prices were much higher than the engineer's estimate uh, due to various reasons. There's been recent increases in material costs, which I'm sure you're aware of, um, just with everything going on in the world and um, in the country, supply chain challenges remain. And then what we heard from contractors who um, we reached out to and asked, you know, why, why didn't you bid on this project? They're, uh, they're all very busy and there's a lack of availability of contractor resources. And when contractors are busy, that um, makes usually makes um, bid prices higher. So the recommendation today, although the um, prices came in much higher than the um, estimate, we are recommending moving forward with awarding the construction contract um, due to the critical nature, we want to have this construction done this year. Um, we, you know, the other option is repackaging and re-advertising this project, which would take several months, and there's no guarantee that the the bid prices would be any lower or any different than what we received um, last week. So, um, staff's recommending accepting the bids that we received and authorizing the executive director to execute a construction contract with Cal West Construction. We've included a 10% contingency for a total contract allotment of $697,500. And that concludes my presentation and I hand it back to you, Chair Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Uh, are there members of the commission uh, who have questions? Uh, Commissioner Rotkin, I see your hands. Just a brief comment. Um, you know, Robert Quinn's earlier comment. Uh, there, yes, there are certainly situations where uh, there's a difference in price between uh, upgrading or repairing damage to the uh, corridor if it's going to be a rail project rather than a pedestrian. But this is a classic example of one that's required. You just look at the picture we just saw. You can't have a trail if that thing erodes another three feet or something, we're dead. So it's obviously a good project for maintaining this corridor for any kind of transportation use. That's my only comment. And I want to support that when we get to the issue uh, action part of the item. Thank you, Commissioner Rodkin. I, I was having similar thoughts. Uh, okay, um, C Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the report designated a couple of causes for erosion. One was drainage and the other was um, foot traffic. And then there's natural erosion on the, on the, um, the shoreline as we experience here in Capitola, of course. So I was just wondering, um, what is the natural erosion rate this fix, you said is gonna be a permanent fix. So I was just wondering how long will the fix last? What's your estimate? And um, how much erosion was probably caused by uh, drainage 
uh, foot traffic. So those sort of three questions. Thank you. So um, that's a really good question. We um, anticipate this. This is a pretty big investment for this area, um, and I, I would say that this new repair would last at least thirty years, if not longer. But the um, the answer is it depends, right? It always depends on um, various factors. Um, if you know, if we properly maintain our ditches and the drainage, um, that's obviously going to prolong the um, facility um, life. And the um, the fencing is really important because of the foot traffic. What we saw when this got critical was um, it kind of created some benching down the cliff. And so we saw an increase in foot traffic when it became critical. Um, and so that was that was the reason for the heavy duty um, orange uh, fencing around it to try to um, prevent people from walking down it. So it all depends. I mean, this is not just, you know, we fix it and we walk away and we're good for 50 years. This is the kind of area that we're going to need to monitor constantly. Um, we're going to need to make sure the fence is continuous and maintain the fence. Um, that's obviously an investment, but we feel that it's an important investment that's going to cost a lot less than um, than something structural. So that's our that's somewhat of our maintenance strategy out here. Um, and Guy, I see your hand up. Do you want to add any more to that? Yeah, I mean, I've looked at this site pretty closely, and um, we had just recently gone to the Coastal Commission to discuss this, a similar situation with coastal erosion um, uh, further north on the Davenport project, but they're very different projects. Um, at Davenport, the waves are actually undermining um, the embankment. This is more of a drainage problem, um, and I do think that uh, the, the foot traffic often um, causes part of the, the drainage problem. So proper drainage and um, uh, elimination of the foot uh, traffic should um, provide that this wall be able to serve its full service life, which um, actually would be closer to 50 or 100 years. So I don't, you know, if we continue to maintain this, we will. Um, I, I want to uh, mention that both all, all three commissioners that spoke on, on this were correct, Commissioner Quinn, Commissioner um, uh, uh, Rodkin, and uh, Chair Brown. Um, we do need to do something here regardless of whether we um, uh, uh, are building a trail or, or, or a rail or whatnot, but um, this wall was designed to withstand freight loads, so it is um, a, a more substantial wall than you would need to if you did not have freight loads there. Um, what the incremental difference is, is hard to say. We didn't design it just for pedestrian uh, use, but we, you know, there is a difference between uh, how we are approaching this with, with freight rail on there. Thank you very much for those responses. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hurst. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a classic example of, um, of the need for preventative maintenance. You know, these, these conditions just didn't occur overnight. They've been going on for quite some time and had uh, preventative maintenance uh, taken place earlier on in the circumstances, uh, it might not be quite the uh, high level expense today. So I would just use this as an example for other locations and, and this one as well, of the need for observation preventative maintenance and uh, biting the bullet when um, it comes at you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rockin. I would also add, you know, thanks to our staff, I, I went out there with a number of other commissioners to look at the site. Um, and what's the good news is that there's an alternative way for uh, pedestrians to get down to the beach that's not that far away. This is kind of like when people on uh, hiking trails and, you know, in the Sierra sort of, you know, cut across, instead of staying on the, the switchbacks, um, you know, cut across and they create erosion problems. And it's a just a small inconvenience for people to do something that won't destroy their own ability to get down to the beach in the future. So I, I, it would be a more of a 
dilemma of putting this fence meant people couldn't get to the beach, but uh, it's not a problem at all to move a little bit further over and walk down on the existing, uh, you know, a, a path that won't cause this kind of erosion. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Yeah, is there any um, planting and such to uh, help with um, potential erosion so that it's even more permanent than 50 years to 100? Um, sometimes that is a good solution is to um, install uh, what we call jute netting uh, and and seeding, but that's really um, typical for flatter slopes. This is a really steep, uh, almost sheer cliff in some areas. And so, um, you know, vegetation wasn't the right solution. We do look at um, lower cost um, slope stabilization solutions um, along our corridor where we do have um, erosion elsewhere, but a retaining wall was really um, the best solution here and it's gonna provide for a, a much longer life also than, than planting wood as well. No, I fully support the retaining. I was just thinking um, vegetation and other areas that are, might be appropriate. Um, would also help. Thank you. Commissioner Quinn. Oh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Back in September, I volunteered to contact the Surfrider uh, organization to see if they'd collaborate on putting signage here. And I reached out twice. I got a response from the Surfrider UCLA chapter, but did not win the favor of a response from the local chapter. So maybe a letter from the RTC itself rather than an individual like myself would get more traction. It, it would be nice to get to get those surfers who are a big part of the traffic to take the Man Racer Trail. That's a great Thank idea. You. Thank that you. would be that's a really good idea. Um, and we are still um, we haven't forgotten about that comment, and we are still interested in in installing those signage as a follow up to this construction project. So. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Yes, thank you. Good idea. Uh, okay, we will go out to the public now for comments. Uh, Brian Trail Now, you're up. Yeah, thanks. This is Brian from Trail Now. Thank you. Um, you know, the cost escalation is a great example of what we talked about on the RTP. Really need to reevaluate the overall cost impact on your overall transportation plans. Uh, one of the specific questions I would ask is, is this design uh, also uh, going to accommodate 60 passenger trains a day traveling 50 miles an hour through that area? Would that accommodate that? Is, if it's for freight, does it also accommodate passenger trains? Um, I think I understand that the RTC staff didn't do a gap analysis in the way of the differential between a simple trail versus freight train. Definitely, I bet a dollar that a simple trail is significantly less in cost and uh, overall. Um, and then the other thing is, is it's really um, frustrating when we're spending almost a million dollars just to maintain this dirt lot, essentially this dirt lot. We need to start um, looking more, investing and in making the coastal trail open. Um, and then finally, the question is, are you going to pull the tracks up as part of the, the work? It wasn't clear in the detailed project scope. And if you are pulling up the tra tracks, um, should maybe you shouldn't re put them back in. You know, we got a cost estimate um, as part of the project to pull the tracks and put in an interim trail, simple gravel trail. The actual recycle value of the ties and uh, rails was $4 million. That was about a year and a half ago. We've had multiple bids. Um, it's probably $6 million, maybe $8 million now. So we have a basically a gold mine sitting there with these old tracks and ties that we're not using. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Pupils. Uh, David VB, you're up. Ah, good. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, so yeah, this looks great. And um, yes, of course, uh, everything's expensive now, but it's always better to do repairs uh, sooner than later. So thank you for taking care of our valuable asset. Uh, in addition to the fence, I, I, uh, as others have mentioned, I hope there's appropriate signage and quality paths to encourage foot traffic to avoid this more sensitive route. And uh, happily, Commissioners Watkin and Quinn uh, touched on that as well. And uh, perhaps in the future, uh, there could be beautification of the fence. It could be a, a decorative opportunity. But thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scott. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm encouraged to, to know that uh, repairs are being done. And I'm encouraged that repairs are being done to a freight standard as they, as I think they should be. Um, I'd like to take a moment to talk quickly about ridership. I think uh, those who read all the details for all the studies know that that actual reliable ridership numbers have never been conducted, and that was, could be part of the business plan. To Mr. Quinn's observation about traffic congestion reductions from rail transit, you know, does anyone ever ask how much? Traffic is reduced from metro. Traffic congestion for automobiles is not the point of public transit projects. Uh, finally, about the repairs being done to a freight standard, that is perfect. That's what we need. We need strong reinforced rail infrastructure, even if we never use freight, because there is gonna be a time when we have a flood, a fire, an earthquake, a tsunami, or a combination of these things, and you know that the highway is not going to work. It's going to be the first thing to go down, even if it has extra lanes. It's going to be dead and still. And I, I hope we don't see it anytime soon, but there's going to be a time when we can use this rail line for emergency evacuations, recovery, and so forth. And I beg everyone, even if you're not a fan of, of rail, invest in this rail line, keep it up to uh, freight standards, and uh, and then we'll have the strongest, most robust, and safest uh, infrastructure network that we could possibly ask for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I do not see any other hands up from the public, so I will bring it back to the commission. I move the staff recommendation. Second. Okay, <laughs> we have a... a Motion by Commissioner Schiffer and second by Commissioner Rotkin. Um, can we take a roll call vote, please? Well, I, I just before I didn't see any hands up, so I'm going to assume that means no comments. Okay. Yeah, that was okay. my assumption. Got it. Okay, go for it. Um, uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Bertrand. Commissioner. Jack, you there? Unmute. You're on mute, Commissioner Bertrand. <laughs> I pushed the space bar. I thought it worked. Okay, I approve. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Alternate uh, Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commission Alternate Pegler? Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. We will now move on to uh, item 23. This is a review of items to be discussed in closed session. And that would be Mr. Mattis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the commission will be going into closed session on the item of um, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation. Um, there is a possibility there would be a report out of closed session today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Commissioner um, Rackin. Yeah, can, I, I know we are not required to disclose the uh, issue that we're talking about, but I want to ask Steve, it, is it possible to tell people, give people some idea of the topic that is under discussion? 
uh, with the if that's the desire of the council, I can provide a, a, just a brief topic. I, I wouldn't recommend that you go beyond the topic. No, I just meant literally the topic. I mean, not not any discussion of what the choices are or anything else, but literally, what are we talking about? I mean, if it's, I'll leave it to the chair to judge whether that's an appropriate thing for us to, you know, to share with the public. But I, you know, it's helpful to tell people something about what we're talking about. No, no, I think everybody knows. I think so. I, I, I just think it's a formality. I think it's probably should, it gives people some notice about what's about to happen, and because then they have a right to comment on it before we go into the session if they're going to. Right. I think that's a good idea. I was going to make the comment that based on our written communications, uh, it appears that there are many members of the public who um, are aware of the item, have different. Uh, interpretations of what that item is. So I, it, it would be nice to just have a, a quick uh, yeah, yeah. explanation. Great. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to do that. So that the item that today is a closed session that allows the commission to consider the initiation of litigation. A litigation does include administrative hearings before administrative bodies. Uh, the commission uh, item today would be the consideration of, well, I would say the further, uh, the consideration of the potential of an adverse abandonment action um, involving uh, the uh, Felton line. And beyond that, um, I would suggest the commission, as the commission has received uh, the uh, prior uh, confidential communication on this, that um, it is not, it, the public should not assume that a decision will be made today uh, with regards to this issue. Uh, the commission does have the ability to discuss issues associated with it, but there, there shouldn't be an assumption that a decision will be made today. And to be very clear, nor is the commission foreclosed from making a decision today. It could also be disclosed that the staff's not necessarily recommending that we do so. Well, I, I, I wouldn't, I appreciate the comment was made, but but uh, the, the that information is part of a, a, a confidential memo to the commission, and the commission needs to decide collectively whether they want to authorize release of additional information. Thank you, Mr. Mattis. Um, so we will will discuss the substance and process around this item uh, when we move into closed session. Before that, uh, I will open it up to. Uh, a meeting attendees who would like to address us before we uh, go into closed session. And Brian from Trail Now is up first. Thank you, Brian from Trail Now. You know, a little history here. Um, a decade ago, we were speaking with former Supervisor Ellen Prairie about the purchase prior to the purchase of the corridor. You know, there was three things I remember from the discussion. One was we we're on the same page with the supervisor about acquiring this property because it's such a valuable piece of transportation infrastructure for our community. We were on board with her on that. The second one, we were actually on board as well, where she said uh, the viability of a train is, is not practical. 60 trains a day speeding through our neighborhoods is very dangerous and it's not uh, a viable economic solution for our community. And Supervisor Ellen Perry said that, she publicly said it, that she just wanted to acquire the property because of the, and continuous keep the property. The third one, I was actually shocked and I was actually uh, surprised and I didn't believe her, but it turns out to have occurred. She said, train people will prevent the building of the trail. This was 10 years ago before we bought it. She said, train people will stop us from building the trail. Um, I was shocked and I didn't believe her, but evidently that's what, what has occurred. And, and it's really shocking because Santa Cruz is such an environmentally awareness type of community. And it's so shocking that we're stopping a world-class Santa Cruz coastal trail from being built because of this train people. And I didn't make up that term. She did. It was the first time I ever heard it. Train people are preventing us from doing this. So my point here is you need to enable staff to negotiate with the train people and make it so that our community property can be opened up 
so we can use it. It's been sitting there for 10 years. We're spending millions of dollars. Please enable staff, legal counsel to pursue and be successful on opening up the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail now. Thank you. Okay, um, and I'll just remind folks that uh, I didn't want to cut you off, Mr. Peoples. This is uh, an item, our closed session item is about uh, uh, adverse of potential adverse abandonment of the Felton line. I understand there's an indirect connection, but if we could try to keep the comments directed to what we will be considering, um, recognizing there is a broader set of considerations, um, that would be great. Uh, Trink Praxel is up. Ms. Praxel, you're up next. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I want to first remind the commissioners of what the first couple sentences of the Brown Act says. Quote, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments they have created, unquote. This is a reminder that while there may be very specific circumstances in which a governmental body may have the authority to go into closed session, it should use that authority very judiciously in full consideration of the public's interest. Thank you for disclosing that this session is likely about filing an adverse abandonment of the Felton section of the line, and many of us feel very strongly that any such decision needs to be made in open session. I want to ask the commissioners to consider the years of study, the workshops, the public hearings that have been held on the use of our rail corridor, and ask you to carefully consider whether you think it is within the intent of the Brown Act to, act, to finally make a decision about a portion of that corridor behind closed doors. Even if you have the legal right to make that decision in closed session, do you really think it meets the general intent of the law? Public discussion about the corridor is very heated right now, and there are many claims of false and misleading information. I ask you to bring that deliberation and decision into the light of an open meeting, and use that opportunity to inform the public, clarify any public misinformation, and hear their opinions. Any decisions on this made in closed session will eventually be known and remembered by your constituents and would definitely diminish the public's confidence in your actions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Praxel. Uh, Equity Transit, you're up. Thank you, Chair. Equity Transit understands that the executive RTC staff may be seeking adverse abandonment of a Felton branch line during closed door sessions and is opposed to adverse abandonment of any section of our branch line for numerous reasons involving environment, equity, and economics. But especially in light of the extensive community involvement seeking to protect our publicly owned Santa Cruz branch line for zero emissions light rail passenger use, these discussions must remain public. It's important to remember that the voting majority of this county voted for Proposition 116, the Clean Air and Transportation Improvement Act, which allowed us in 2012 to purchase the Santa Cruz branch line specifically for developing passenger rail. And many of us, by the way, um, in response to Brian, are both heavy users of the trail as cyclists and support rail. Numerous studies, including the TCAA, have been conducted by the RTC, clearly showing prioritization for light rail and trail as the best addition for transit along the entire north-south transit corridor, not highway widening. Rail transit ridership statistics from past years are irrelevant today. Increasingly, people are becoming aware of the importance of moving towards using public rail transit, and this information is supported by the state rail plan connecting cities across the state of California. But the critical work done here is making its way slowly down to smaller communities like Santa Cruz County, who have local groups keen on keeping us stuck in traffic on highways. The RTC was certainly in line with these global actions until 2021 when pressure from wealthy, powerful, anti-public transit groups like Greenway managed to place two of their leaders, Manu Koenig and Rob Quinn, onto the RTC and Manu onto the Board of Supervisors. At the recent UN, UN climate change conferences in Glasgow, global leaders were clear that preserving the future for living organisms on this planet uh, the consensus is clear, highway widening must stop, and our future is dependent on, on prioritizing and building robust, mm -hmm. equitable, zero carbon transportation systems. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Judy Gittleson, your turn. 
Hi, I'm Judy Gittleson, a Watsonville resident, and I work with people with developmental disabilities and people with special needs. And I just want to say that I echo the sentiments that this is a public issue and um, wasn't just a question to the RTC, wasn't the um, uh, majority of the active voters support electric passenger rail and didn't they define a locally preferred alternative as passenger rail? So I think that while you are presenting this as a um, useful solution, I think it's really cutting off a large part of South County. And I think it's cutting off public transportation, which is a really good thing for a lot of people. I'm not saying don't do the trail. I'm saying don't tear out the tracks. And any action taken in that direction is uh, putting the climate in jeopardy and putting the area in jeopardy and not looking toward our grandchildren. So commissioners, please use your best sense in this. And, and it's a public issue. And I believe the public has already voted in that they do prefer the um, train as a locally preferred alternative. I appreciate your efforts and um, hope you keep the people in mind that will be using the public transportation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gittleson. Um, Sally for Rail and Trail, you are up next. Hi, um, I wanna just, uh, Thank Mr. Rotkin for uh, bringing up this issue of the way closed sessions are described being perhaps accurate, but not informative. And that the connects to what Ms. Praxel said about the intent of the Brown Act. When we have uh, closed sessions that are labeled so um, generally as to be useless, it is not, and then we, you, you know, the public is invited to speak. Or, uh, it's not, um, it's, it kind of makes a, a mockery of the intent of the Brown Act. And I really appreciate the, uh, the commission giving direction to their council to be more specific. And I hope that that will be done in agendas, written agendas in the future so that people who are looking to see, is this a meeting I need to attend? What's gonna be discussed? No, it's not an, if the agendas listings are so general as to be useless, it does not really inform the public as to what's going on. And um, I won't repeat everything people said, you know, people know I want the, I want rail and trail both, you know, you've got over 200 emails that say the same thing. Um, it's, um, I, you know, that's really not the point at this moment. It is an issue of process. And I, and in an answer to, and as a continuation of that, I just like to ask that people be, that, could you be very specific about exactly how and when we can hear the report out after closed session? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, let's see, David VB, Mr. Van Brink, you're up. Uh, good, uh, uh, good morning still. Uh, so uh, yes, it was implied at the beginning of this meeting that uh, one of the closed session items touches on rail abandonment. And, and I figured that the rumors we got were maybe not quite accurate, but did I hear correctly that you're considering acting against the Felton line against Roaring Camp? That's a bold move with some interesting optics. Roaring Camp is quite popular. They're very good community members. It's an interesting battle plan to be sure. It's obvious what the strategy there is. Please keep it in public. Come on, don't be sneaky. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scott. You're up. Thank you. I was waiting for the button to pop up. I, I sure really sincerely want to thank uh, Mike Rock and my superhero for the day for bringing this up. I don't know of anyone that had any idea that the Felton line was about to be, well, attacked this way. An adverse abandonment is typically done against the will of a railroad. An adverse abandonment of the Felton line seems mindless and, and, and strategic. I, don't, I look forward to finding out what kinds of reasons there are to be going after the Felton line. Um, but more than ever, I am 
I'm sure this needs to be done in public with great detail, a lot of input. And, and, and I think Roaring Camp, its employees, residents and voters of the county need to know what this is about. I can see no reason. I have no, no I, I understand. I, can, I can, can't imagine why you would do an adverse abandonment against Roaring Camp except to use this motion in a threatening manner. And uh, it's just, I'm, I'm so sad. But again, I'm really grateful to Mike and I'm confident that most of the, most of the uh, commissioners will, um, will not be supportive of this, this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, Todd Marco, you're up. Hi, thanks. I've spent a substantial amount of time in recent weeks and months, arguably much too much time, uh, trying to deeply understand the challenges facing the RTC and the community regarding our rail corridor. I deeply sympathize with the challenging position that RTC finds itself in. Much remains unclear, but there does seem to be substantial common ground here, believe it or not. The vast majority of people seem supportive of a trail and the vast majority of people seem to agree that improvements are needed for local public transportation. Ultimately, these two priorities have come into conflict on the rail corridor, resulting in substantial divisiveness. I'd like to encourage the RTC to appropriately satisfy the community's needs for trail and transit, not just on the rail corridor and regardless of potential rail transit development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bryn Young, you are next. Great, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the RTC for, uh, in general, the uh, FAC on rail banking in general. At the end of the September RTC meeting, Commissioner Rodkin noted that you won't know about your easement liability until you wind up in court. So um, I'm assuming that the right process to relieve Santa Cruz County from this liability is rail banking. And I'm just offering it as a comment that to the degree a stranded line is preventing from rail banking to relieve the county from, from the potentially large liabilities it would have from easements from takings lawsuits. It may end up being a particularly good thing for whether it's trail or trail and rail. Either way, there's easement liability. And either way, I think adverse abandonment might be something that actually would provide for both sides something that can um, be to be a, uh, the community's advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the hands are coming up, <laughs> moving up. So uh, keep, keep going here. Um, Ryan Sarnataro, uh, your turn. Yeah, I submitted a short comment uh, prior to the meeting. And, and what that comment was, was that the issue around rail banking is simply a liability issue. It's not an issue that determines the disposition of the corridor, as much as I have my own position on what position, I how I'd like to see it done. And I think that looked at from that point of view, the, the RTC has a fiscal responsibility to our whole community to protect us as much as possible from whatever easement lawsuits might happen. And, and the means to do that is rail banking. Um, and I, at some future point, and hopefully a very uh, close future point, we're going to be going into the, the, the final discussion about what to, uh, what to do with the corridor. Brian Peoples happened to mention that the bids that went out for the, the fix in the previous uh, segment was uh, did not include an option for a trail only fix. And I, again, that's that's the idea that that money is slipping away in the pursuit of an option that could very well be absolutely impossible for the county to go and complete. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Colligan, Ed Colligan, you're up. Thank you, Chair Brown and commissioners. I think, uh, as Ryan just said, it is completely clear what this commission do should do with regard to, to rail banking. 
I believe that Lawrence Kaplan forwarded you the lawsuit from about 50 property owners in Sonoma County who have sued the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit District SMART. Uh, it's a 93 page suit, you all have it. And I think you should read it very carefully because in it, those plaintiffs argue that uh, the uh, trail that was being built when the corridor was not rail banked by SMART is in violation of their easements. These kinds of takings lawsuits occur all over the country. And it is in the best interests of the county and the taxpayers of the county to rail bank the corridor. I would also like to just say quickly uh, to Mr. Rockin's comments that it appears that um, certain commissioners are violating their responsibility as commissioners in disclosing information in closed session. This is not the first time, but it appears to be a direct uh, line of communication between certain com commissioners and folks outside of closed sessions. And so, um, you know, we can talk about the Brown Act and open transparency, which I support. What I don't support is particular commissioners leaking information to certain interest groups in this county. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Colligan. I believe we have completed uh, public comments and um, we, uh, I'm seeing hands go up uh, from commissioners. So we'll um, give an opportunity for that <clears throat> before we move into closed session. Um, Commissioner Hurst, your turn. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm a little surprised to uh, to hear all about this because it's uh, not very transparent. And I think if we're going to have good policy, good policy always needs to be developed in the in the light of the day and uh, have uh, adequate uh, public input and uh, announcements and you know do some background work on this and to hear about. Uh, abandonment. Uh, I think abandonment is a bad policy no matter what, but to have it done in closed session outside of uh, public purview and, and folks don't know anything about it, uh, that's, uh, that's almost deceptive. And so I, I think that the, the commission needs to be very careful in how they proceed with these actions and make sure that the public is adequately informed and even if you make bad decisions, do them in the in the light of day and not hide behind uh, the closed doors of, of uh, closed session on these major policy type issues. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hurst. Commissioner McPherson. You are uh, muted. Yeah. Okay, my comments are short and sweet. Listen, general public, no decisions have been made of any type in closed session on this subject. It's not what we do, it's not what we should do, and it's not what we're going to do. So I think we ought to make it really clear that no decisions have been made in closed session. This issue will be discussed openly. I can guarantee that because none of these commissioners would allow it to happen one way or the other without open discussion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, you took the words out of my mouth <laughs> there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll save my comments for uh, until other commissioners have a chance to weigh in. I see uh, Commissioner Hernandez, you have your hand up. Well, I'll be short and brief too. I just wanna echo the, the comments that Lowell Hurst made and, and um, uh, Ms. McPherson as well. You know, I think that such a big decision like this, uh, I think really should be brought out in the public uh, and let it be, you know, let it out with public discourse, with uh, public participation, and not be done, you know, behind closed doors. So that's it. That's all my comment. Short. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. I just find it interesting that when people are threatened and they feel like things aren't going their way, just how quickly, with such alacrity, that they want to delegitimize the process. Now, I've been on this commission for many, many years. We've had many, many closed sessions. And I would ask our council, um, 
Are we doing something wrong here by going into closed session? We do it routinely, but please um, let me know if, if something wrong is, is, is going on that's illegitimate here so we can have the people that are trying to delegitimize the process can at least hear it. So help me out, help me understand. Madam Chair, if I, I may, the, the commission is fully authorized to go into closed session to consider the item today. The government code specifically allows for this type of closed session and the uh, commission would report out of closed session any direction that is given, including if it is the desire of the commission to direct that there be uh, additional further public discussion of this issue. So right there, I guess I'm I'm hearing that what we're doing is right, that we're do, what we're doing is proper, and we're not subverting the process in any way, and that uh, I'm surprised by some of the commissioner the commissioners that would go to the lengths that they really are going. To, to make this look like it's a thing, quote, behind closed doors. Uh, it offends me, really. And Lowell, I, I'm surprised. Commissioner Rotkin. First of all, I, I strongly support the Brown Act. It does have two elements to it, or more than two, but two main elements, one of which is that there are certain things that need to be discussed in closed session. Um, without getting into any details about this, if you're talking about uh, potential lawsuits or administrative procedures that involve uh, uh, issues about like what you know what what are your likes likely prospects for success, what the cost would be to carry out the activity and so forth, it's important for commissioners to get that information in a closed session. You don't want to disclose to the people you might end up being sued by or suing whatever the general issue is you're talking about. Uh, it makes it impossible to have negotiations with. Uh, or, or, or in some level to sort of decide, you don't want to disclose to the people you're going to find yourselves in court against, knowing exactly what your own assessment of the, the likelihood of your success is. Um, I also strongly support the part of the Brown Act that says people are not supposed to disclose what happens in closed sessions. Uh, I heard from a member of the public uh, that we were having a discussion about possible adverse abandonment. I didn't hear about it from the uh, uh, staff or anybody else. I don't know how they, that person found it. It certainly wasn't for me. Uh, I've been on public office now for over 31 or two years and never disclose anything from closed sessions. And I think it's, um, you know, it's very difficult when it happens. The fact that someone disclosed that then started these rumors going and which has now led people that was, that's what led me to sort of argue that we have to sort of clarify what we're doing because the public all of a sudden are up in arms about what have been, I think, uh, as everybody suggested here, not a major decision made in a closed session, but just gathering information that as commissioners, we need to know about our legal prospects in a particular issue. But once it became a, a rumor was out that we're about to make that kind of a decision, then I felt really compelled to sort of like, now we need to, so I don't know how it got out there, but now we need to at least disclose something about what it is we're talking about again. Uh, but it, it's, uh, to me, it's really critical that people not disclose things from closed sessions, that Randy's right, that, you know, that there's things you need that's not only legal, but it's necessary to be able to meet in closed session and gather information that you wouldn't want to be disclosing to the people you're going to find yourself battling in the legal situation. So, or potentially battling in the legal situation. And that's true in a lot of the kinds of decisions we make. So I think there are reasons to do some things in closed session, not to make major decisions about policy. And I don't, We'll, we'll find out, but I don't think there's members of this board that are uh, inclined towards making a major decision about adverse abandonment or whatever we're talking about or anything else in, in the closed session. We'll gather information that will be useful to us that will then have to come out in public. And one of the things we'll have to figure out in the closed session is what parts of that information that we get is important for the public to understand. Some of it may not be. It may be technical legal issues that are not critical. Um, but there may be things that we that we find out that we think are important to disclose to the public, so they understand what we're weighing in the balance here. But that's that's to be decided, I think, in some level. So I, I, I think I don't think our staff's done anything wrong. I, I assume our staff are not the people who disclose this, but I don't even know. I, I didn't even know the information, and I didn't know what the literal issue was in our closed session until I got the memo, which was a couple of days ago. Not this has been out there for at least about two weeks or something that people have been jumping up and down about it, and I don't know how they found out that that was a topic in closed session. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to just take a, a moment to respond to 
the questions and concerns that I have heard raised in, in three areas uh, related to the Brown Act. One is discuss closed session discussions and what's appropriate or not appropriate or allowable within closed session. Uh, also communications about the, the nature of the agenda item itself to make the public aware. Uh, and then the question about closed session confidentiality. Um, and I guess I'll start with the closed session confidentiality. Um, you know, I'll just re remind, I I'm, agree with the statements that have been made uh, about uh, commissioners maintaining that confidentiality, not sharing information out of closed session. Um, and I would just, remind everyone that there are other actors involved in these conversations who are not uh, public officials, uh, who are not commissioners, who have, you know, may have conversations as well. So, you know, there's there's going to be speculation about <laughs> what and who says what, but I, I just want to remind folks of that. Um, uh, secondly, uh, in terms of the the question about uh, what, how, then how we describe what will be heard in closed session. Uh, there are uh, obviously concerns with for, about confidentiality when it comes to legal matters, uh, property negotiations, etc. Um, and I also do recognize that uh, to the extent that we can provide some additional information or, or substance to help the public understand that is a good idea. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin, for bringing this up today. And as chair, I will um, I will commit myself to uh, kind of double checking those and and checking with our staff and legal counsel to make sure that we provide enough information that we're allowed to provide, so we can hopefully begin to dispel some of the or you know kind of cut off some of the speculation that you know inevitably arises when things are very unclear and there are room then rumors get started etc so I'll, I'll uh commit to that uh, and then uh, on the first item i mentioned i'll i'll end there and say you know i absolutely am committed as a public servant to doing the public's business in public and i don't want to speak for other commissioners but you've heard from at least some and i've talked with others i i don't believe this commission will make the, the a decision of that um this kind of import uh in a closed session um, I believe that there are items that we are required to uh, handle in closed session, and you've heard some of the reasons why. I won't repeat those. Um, and then there are items that we are allowed to discuss in closed session. Um, and and I have been uh, as a city council member and uh, you know public servant uh, very much committed to ensuring that discussions that we are able to have in uh, public meetings are are put on the public agenda. I will continue to advocate for that, um, and this is no exception. Uh, we will uh, continue this conversation uh, at uh, most likely at a future meeting. And um, with that, uh, seeing no other commission comments, I'll um, now close the meeting and move us into closed session. Uh, and um, if anybody, I just want to say for commissioners, uh, you have a separate link for that. So we'll uh, jump off this line and then hop on the other Zoom. I know some commissioners have had issues accessing that information. But, so if you don't have the link, please do uh, let staff know so we can get you on and we can get moving pretty quickly. But I'll, I'll give us five minutes here for a, a quick bio break and transition. Uh, before you do that, uh, Chair, I think it may be good to hear from the attorney about reporting out, uh, whether uh, there'll yes, be a report you. out um, and not adjourning the meeting uh, if there, and for closing the possibility of yeah. report out if there is something. So thank you. Um, thank, thank you. you. Good to clarify yeah. that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I was sort of operating on an assumption, and so we should get here a little bit more about that, and and we may reopen depending on what happens. Uh, Mr. Mattis, please. thank you, Madam Chair. So the um, the the commission, uh, assuming there's any kind of reportable direction, uh, which which could be anticipated today, then the uh, commission would make that out in public on this Zoom at the end of the closed session. The closed session will be dictated by the length of time it 
it takes for the commission to receive information and, and have its own internal discussion. So, but we will come back to this Zoom and we'll report out any reportable actions at the end of the closed session. If I might interject for a second, second, um, Chair Brown, as you're aware, we lose this feed at 12.30. Um, so there's a possibility that if the closed session is not finished at that time, that we will not be able to report out on this Zoom call. Um, and so um, I'm asking uh, our attorney if whether we could report out via um, uh, a quick report that we could um, post to our website. Uh, so we we could do that if it's possible to extend the Zoom um, guy, that would be better. If we cannot do that, just so that the public can actually see the report out and they have to create a separate uh, Zoom and just identify that Zoom ID on the on the RTC website. Um, I don't, if, if we have this Zoom through 1245, I'm, I'm not, I think there's a reasonable chance we will make that time period at 1230. I'm sorry. 1240, uh, I, we got it until 1245. 1245. Okay. Yeah. So could we say, um, uh, if for some reason we are not able to report out on the zoom because we, we do lose the, the zoom feed and that is not in the RTC's control, um, that we would just post a link to the website so people could log back on Correct. Uh, if if they're wanting to to hear back. Great. That, that is okay. correct. Great. So then we'll um, we'll close the open session portion of the meeting and move into closed session. Uh, see you all in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, we're ready to go. Okay, so I'll just uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Mattis to give a report out from closed session. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the uh, commission just concluded the closed session on the item listed on the agenda. Uh, the commission, by a 10 to 2 vote, directed staff to place an open session and a closed session item on the agenda at the next meeting. The open session item would involve the uh, consideration of issues associated with a potential adverse abandonment action. Uh, the closed session direction was provided to the staff uh, to report back with the appropriate closed session information. Uh, the commission also requested that staff provide certain information uh, prior to that meeting, and that information will be included both in uh, where relevant in the staff report for the open session and as appropriate in any closed session confidential communication. Madam Chair, that is the report out of closed session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mattis. And I believe with that, we are now officially adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you all and, for your patience who've been waiting for us yeah, to get back. Yeah, thank you to the people who are, who are waiting for us. Um, see you next time. Take Bye. Care. Everybody take care.